Good morning and welcome to Team Resiliency Prosthetic and PTSD Continuing Education course. I'm Linda Woods, your moderator for today. The last 20 months have been very challenging and we want to help the medical professionals obtain credit hours and share solutions to the challenges our patients are facing during this pandemic. Team Resiliency is made up of Dr. Ivan Edwards, prosthesis Jesse Retelli, social worker Tim Earnhardt, and nurse and below the knee amputee Dan Blasini, and Tom Bourgeois, who is also a below the knee amputee. We'll be focusing on the pre and post operative care of traumatic limb and amputations and the causes of treatment with patients with PTSD. At the end of the program, we will have a housekeeping slide that will direct attendees on how to obtain your evaluation forms and certificates. Please enter Halston at newlifeandbraceandlimb.com and include the word present so we can use the emails to replace the sign-in sheet. Please enter any questions into the chat space and we will address them at the end of each presentation. At this time, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Ivan Edwards. Dr. Ivan Edwards is a physician, CEO, a United States Air Force flight surgeon, a community leader engaged in various humanitarian initiatives, and a public speaker. He is, has expertise in multiskeletal medicine, neurorehabilitation, and comprehensive pain management. He is board certified in PMMR and is a fellow of the American Academy of PMNR. He is also a CEO, owner of Giovanna Rehabilitation Medical Medicine and Pain located in San Antonio, Texas. He is a military officer currently serving as a United States Air Force Reserve Flight Surgeon at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Dr. Edwards is a board member of a few hospitals, medical executives, and board committees. He has participated in humanitarian initiatives for health and education and neurorehabilitation. As a respected authority figure, he has assisted in numerous court cases pertaining to injuries, trauma, and rehabilitation. Dr. Edwards holds memberships in multiple organizations via the Aerospace Medical Association, the Military Officers Association in American, and the Society of United States Air Force Flight Surgeon. He is an elected fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Dr. Edwards is a commissioned Kentucky Colonel. He is a public speaker both locally and internationally. He has spoken on topics related to health, the human condition, personal growth, and environment and relevant topics. Also joining us will be prosthesis Jesse Redditelli and registered nurse Dan Blasini. Dan is a U.S. Army veteran and Vice President of Military Affairs for All Seasons Home Health located in San Antonio, Texas. He has been working with the amputee community for over 17 years. He is passionate helping patients and veterans with community recovery and services that support great holistic outcomes. He also brings his personal story helps others cope with amputations and a total recovery plan to take patients to the next chapter in their life. They'll be joining us after a short message from our sponsors. Hi, I'm Pam Kane, the Rehab Director from Methodist Hospital Texan Rehabilitation Center. Inpatient rehab is a service that most people don't know exists as a next phase of care in between a hospital stay and complete independence at home. These convenient centers, typically located within or very close to a hospital, are specially designed for patients who have a life-changing event that results in a loss of independence and mobility. When you are medically stable to begin rehabilitation and work toward your goals of regaining independence, restoring function, and resuming your life, a Methodist Healthcare Intensive and Comprehensive Inpatient Rehabilitation Program may be the best option for you. Patients qualify for inpatient rehabilitation services in four steps. A physician will determine your medical necessity while you are in the hospital. A patient must be willing and able to tolerate three hours of therapy every day. A patient is expected to see functional gains as a result of inpatient rehab. 
and a patient requires two of three services, physical therapy, occupational therapy, or speech and language therapy. Your personalized program is coordinated by a multidisciplinary team of physicians, nurses, therapists, and support staff. You will have all the advantages of being in or near a full service hospital, giving you access to diagnostic testing, pharmacy, physician specialty support, and emergency medical care as needed. The setting where you receive rehabilitation makes all the difference in your recovery. When you are ready to leave the hospital but not quite ready to function safely at home, a Methodist Healthcare Inpatient Rehabilitation Center provides the care you need to help you regain your independence and get back to life. If you're wondering whether you're a candidate for one of our centers, your Methodist Healthcare Clinical Rehab Specialist in partnership with hospital case managers, physicians, and family members will work together to determine if this level of care is the right fit for you. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I feel so much energy in this place. I'm excited beyond measure. We're going to talk about resilience and as it, particularly as it pertains to uh, uh, limb loss. I'm excited. We're going to talk about uh, a lot of things today, wonderful things. I have two wonderful gentlemen here with me and of course with uh, Linda. We're going to talk about a few things. Resilience. What's resilience? We are going to talk about resilience, adaptation, adapting to, and then we're going to talk about overcoming. And what else? What else are we going to chat? Legacy. Legacy. Prosthetics. Prosthetics. Outcomes. Outcomes. Dynamite. So we'll start off with, uh, of course, since this is an educational piece, we have to include some educational material. But remember, we resilience, adapting to, withstanding, I forgot the withstanding, overcoming, overcoming okay. and recovering. So those are key words, okay? Ad adapt to, withstand, overcome, and recover. Yes. Well, let's get the ball rolling, let's get started. So we are going to, of course, since this is a, uh, uh, a lecture, in, in essence, but we're gonna keep it interactive. So the learning objectives are simple. We're going to have a, talk about things that are patient-centric, interdisciplinary care model involved in taking care of uh, people with limb loss. And uh, we're also going to talk about the types and of uh, prosthetics utilized after somebody ha suffers a limb loss. And on top of that, we're going to talk about the most importantly, the pre and post operative care involving traumatic limb amputations. And um, so the next slide will reveal, and I, and I don't like to read, this is patient centric. And as I said before, adaptation, withstanding, overcoming, and recovering. This involves a team approach. A team approach in that the patient is the center and you have all these other professionals around the patient. Prosthetist, what in God's name does that mean? Prosthetist is a individual that's licensed and are certified to design, fabricate, and fit a prosthetic device. And a prosthesis replaces what's missing. Dr. Edwards. Mm, okay, okay, okay. Social work, social worker is involved, a dietitian is involved, occupational therapist is involved, a physician is involved, and... A nurse. A nurse, oh, a nurse. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, we know what a nurse does, correct? Correct. And then we have a physical therapist. But what's that big word? Orthotist. Orthotist. Yeah, what does that mean? Who, what is that? I'm gonna give that to Jess. Oh, okay, you give it back. <laughs> So an orthotist <laughs> is an individual that's licensed or certified to design, fabricate, and fit an orthotic device. And an orthotic device is a device that braces an extremity that's existing. So orthotics braces what's existing, prosthetics replaces what's missing. So the two are different? They are different. Okay. But they are typically performed by the same licensed or certified individual. Okay. And you, you, you can do that? I do both of those. Yes, I am certified and licensed in both orthotics and prosthetics because often a mm -hmm. patient may need not only a prosthesis but also an orthotic device. Okay. Remarkable. Yes. Once again, patient-centric model like what we're talking about today. 
considering okay. the entire patient, mm -hmm. all of their disabilities, all of their mobility challenges, all their physical challenges can be addressed by this team of this interdisciplinary care physical medicine rehabilitation model. So, so let me take a side step. This is very important yes, because what happens when somebody meets a crisis in their lives, you have what we call the tunnel vision, of, right? Tunnel vision. Yes. Once you have the tunnel vision, I dare say you have what we call also tunnel hearing. And tunnel here, you have what we call the mind tunnel and solitude. Yes. Crisis hits you, what does it do? <sighs> tunnel vision. Nothing else exists beyond that tunnel vision. Correct. Correct? So that's why the team approach is necessary. You are able to see things that this person who has a, an injury cannot see. Yes. And you're able to hear things or tell that person things that the person has developed tunnel hearing for. Does that make sense? It does. And also, the different peoples on the team uh -huh. can actually connect with that individual. Not everyone can connect in the beginning, but sometimes it takes a special person. It could be the dietitian, it could be the nurse, it could be the physician. Mm -hmm. So it's a different standpoint, but when you work as a team, mm -hmm. you have that interaction mm -hmm. and that can help that patient connect with everyone else. That's why uh, we, we're gonna talk about the, in, in the next slide, we're gonna talk about the importance of that advocacy. Yes. Because what happens, and you've lived it, this is not something we're talking about here. Correct. This is something that you have lived. Yes. And uh, you have a limb loss. Did you develop tunnel vision? In the beginning, yes. This is it, my world has come to an end? Almost to an end, yes. Almost to an end, but it took somebody to say, no. Yeah. Did he come and say, no. Yes. It's not the end. Actually, he came to my bedside. So it was Jesse that came to my bedside. Remarkable. Rem advocacy is very important because, as I said, and this happens in all crises. When people hit a crisis point, they melt, they develop tunnel vision, and that tunnel vision tells them there is nothing for you. You are done. It's over. So it takes somebody else to somebody else's eyes to see for you, yes, to hear for you, and to reach out for you, and to advocate for you, and to advocate for you. We have found that a lot of people, 92% of patients claim their peer visit improved their outlook. That's amazing, that's more than, I'll say 100%. Yes. 100%. So peer visits are very important, patient advocates are very important. We know that. And uh, we'll, the next slide will we'll revisit a lot of other things. Most, the most common cause of amputations, what is that? The most common cause of yeah. amputations, uh, yeah. usually your trauma. Trauma, trauma-related, yes. okay. And uh, peripheral vascular disease is, is... Peripheral vascular disease is the number one cause of limb loss. So trauma and peripheral vascular disease are the two biggest reasons for limb loss. Okay. So when patients are on your service, more than likely, uh -huh. it's going to be trauma or a vascular disease that caused ischemia for the limb requiring That's amputation. That's a big word, ischemia, but we understand ischemia. most people know ischemia. So mo what, what is the most common area of amputation? Upper vascular. Limb? Upper, lower limb, lower limb amputation. Lower limb amputations, okay. Furthest away from the heart. For, oh, that's good to remember. Yes. Furthest away from the heart. Yes. Okay, so then we're gonna look at what is peripheral vascular disease. Peripheral vascular disease is caused by risk factors such as, I call them the quartet. Oh. You know the quartet? I don't, Okay. Dr. Edwards. Uh, di diabetes can be a risk factor. Hypertension can be a risk factor. And hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol. We call that the triad. Now I'm going to include the quartet, which involves smoking. Mm -hmm. That's a risk factor for peripheral vascular disease. More than half of people who have peripheral vascular disease require an amputation. 54%. That's a big number. That's a big number. That's a big number. 54%, more than half. So more than half of the people who have peripheral vascular disease will actually experience an amputation. And these are preventable diseases, correct? These they are preventable. Mm -hmm. Okay. They are Chronic preventable. disease. Chronic diseases. They are totally, I mean totally, they are, they are preventable on the whole, unless you have uh, other risk factors such as uh, genetics. So um, uh, most, most often associated with diabetes, you have neuropathy as well, which is a uh, nerve condition that involves the extremities, and that can also contribute to peripheral vascular disease. So next, please. And, uh, <clears throat> and um, quite important that we, we, we note that in order uh, to, to kind of de define this problem. We cannot ignore the 45% traumatic amputation. That's correct. Number. It's critical. Most common in young adult males. And uh, the risk factors, risk factors, of course, as we know. 
Motor vehicle collisions. Motor vehicle collision, industrial injuries, farming injuries, even severe burns, and unfortunately also, since I'm also a veteran, and you're a veteran too. Yes. What Army. wars, Army. Yeah. So uh, we, we have people that have been to war and have experienced uh, amputations yes, as a result of that. So those are some of our patients. And uh, next slide, we'll revisit with some, some 2% requiring amputation, the most common cancer amputation is uh, due to osteosarcoma, osteogenic sarcoma, and Ewing sarcoma. And the survival rate has increased due to advances in medicine. Now we know there's a procedure, I would like you to tell me about it, the Van Ness rotation plasty. Van Ness rotation plasty procedure. This is when there may be a, a cancer of the distal femur, the bottom of the thigh bone, or in the knee joint, mm -hmm. requiring amputation for the individual to survive. But the foot portion, that's mm -hmm. the most distal segment, is still healthy and it works. So in effort to preserve the amount of energy that the individual will use to use a prosthesis to walk, they can save the foot, reattach it to the femur, the thigh bone, mm -hmm. flip it around 180 degrees, so the ankle becomes the knee joint. And what this does is significant. So an individual that uses a prosthesis above the knee, when they have to control the knee joint mm -hmm. and the ankle joint, mm -hmm. will use 60% more energy just to walk. That's an increased metabolic rate. So therefore, people typically don't walk as much because it takes so much effort to accomplish a very simple task of walking. Whereas somebody who has a functioning knee joint mm -hmm. and only has to control an ankle joint, right. like in below the knee amputation, right, right. or in this case, rotation plasty, only uses 25% more energy to walk. So it's a significant savings in metabolic cost to save a functional knee joint. And that's why this procedure is very popular for the cancer population where the knee joint is diseased, but the foot section remains healthy. It's remarkable that we have the best minds gathered here today and talking about these things. The stages of care, of course, involve full recovery, which can cover uh, typically 12 to 18 months and is comprised of recovery stages. It does involve the pre-op stage and uh, the acute hospital and immediate post-op stage, and then the immediate post-acute stage. Recovery stage is also in there. Now, these take time on average because they're not, as you've experienced this, it's not fixed in stone. It's not fixed in stone. Right. How long did it take you? I mean, I'm, we, we're going to hear your story. It's coming. But give us a little glimpse as to I how long I was actually it back to work uh, from my amputation in 90 days. Oh, 90 days. 90 days. 90 days. Amazing. And, uh, of course, the pre-op stage involves the selection of the appropriate level of amputation. Uh, we look at things involving blood flow. Tissue viability is quite important. If tissue is dead... We, you can, can anything, what, what can we do about that? It, you have to amputate until there is viable tissue. What is viable? Level. Viable means you have vascularization. Vascularization. And you have healthy tissue for a good tissue envelope to cover the residual limb. Amazing. And of course, with that comes oxygen. The oxygenation is very, you have the vascular circulation is important. The ability to heal after the surgery has been performed. And the anatomy and the bio, biomedical function the ability to maintain a long-term function of residual limb is very important. And of course, the pump, the heart, the cardiac and the expenditure, uh, cardiac expenditure have to be taken into consideration. The pump has to be able to pump blood throughout the, the limbs. That's correct. And to provide also the energy expenditure that it takes to walk That's again correct. after yes. losing a limb. And rehabilitation potential. Yes. What does that mean, Dan? What, especially since you've lived this, what does that mean to you? Basically, everyone's different, and everyone comes to, to, the, to the table, if you will, with uh, different activity levels in their past, mm -hmm. which helps dictate and predict the, the outcomes for the future. So if someone's pretty much athletic in the beginning, they have an easier recovery, in my opinion, from living it and from seeing it in my patients. So someone that's been active, you can really predict where they're going to be mm -hmm. and help them get to that point. Some of that's inactive can still be trained right. and conditioned to move to the next level. Amazing. Re okay, immediate pre-op treatment involves increasing or maintaining that range of motion, which is key. Maintaining muscle strength and function of both upper and lower extremity, especially the non-involved uh, lower extremity. Medication for phantom limb pain is very important because 
the, the limb that has been lost still has a memory map in the brain, and the brain will not forget that. It's quite important that we as physicians take that into consideration. We have to treat uh, phantom limb pain. It's real. The patient feels it. The patient still feels the leg, even when the leg is not there. That's amazing. That is amazing. That's amazing. There's another important thing about the fall prevention program. Uh, this is what I was told, that at any given time, somebody who has a, a limb loss will fall. Yes. 20% of all amputees fall at least once. Do you actually get out of bed and you forget that you have Yes. And one of the things loss. that I've done uh -huh. uh, to prevent that is I put a barrier between mm -hmm. me and the floor. So it could be a wheelchair mm -hmm. or a chair. So when I do wake up, I, I will touch that, which will trigger me, hey, I don't have a leg, so don't take that first step. <laughs> okay. That is amazing. That's, that's amazing. And again, the immediate, we, we talked about, and we're going to talk about the immediate post-op stage. Recovery time in the hospital, that can vary. It's helpful to involve the patient advocate at this point to talk to the patient and the family. Remember what a crisis does. It gives you tunnel vision tunnel vision, we got to break that tunnel vision. The amputee, I hate to use that word amputee, what's the right word? What's the PC word now? So an individual that uses a prosthesis, <laughs> a prosthesis does not define anyone. It does not change who they are. Okay. It increases their physical limitations, uh -huh. it's things for them to overcover, but they're right. not defined by the prosthesis or their amputation. They're okay. an individual that uses a prosthesis. Okay, the individual that uses a prosthesis develops that, uh, that tunnel vision. We need an advocate to break through that tunnel vision, that tunnel hearing and that tunnel mind right. and the tunnel solitude that they have. They're in it by themselves. This Isolation. is me. Yes. So it's Peer the, visitation, very important in the beginning. Right. Somebody's in the hospital. Right. They've just lost their limb. This is a traumatic event, whether it be a traumatic event itself in an accident mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. vascular disease or cancer. Mm -hmm. This is traumatic mm -hmm. to lose a limb you are no longer feeling whole, and you need some type of information. You're looking, you got that tunnel vision like you were saying. Mm -hmm. We need to help bring the light to them. Mm -hmm. Let them know there is hope, there are options, there's people in place that will help them along this journey. And that's why this immediate amputation, uh -huh. peer visitation is so critical. Like we said earlier in the slide, 92% of patients have preferred a peer visit after an amputation. It's very important uh, mm -hmm. that, that they start off the process with someone they can relate to because as an amputee, no one really knows what it's like until you are one. So having the peer visit tour com that comes in and explains things and shows things, it really opens the door for acceptance and that gets them on the path of that great recovery because they see someone that's already walked the walk and talks the talk and shows them and gives them a, a great outlook on what's gonna happen and, and gives them those goals. So what you're telling me, uh, this, is, this is deep, this is deep. If I've had a crisis, and we talk about resilience, being able to adapt to something, yes. being able to overcome and even recover and withstand, withstand, overcome and recover. Yes. I have an amputation and I'm locked into this vision, world of mine. What you guys are telling me, what we are talking about today, is that you're able to take me out of it. Oh, yes. That's correct. You're able to tell me I can do it. Yes. And I will be able to walk. Yes. Very important, immediate post-op stage. This is the time that we talk, uh, take time to, to fit with the I mean, post-operative device uh, we, and uh, to, to make sure that there's no contracture, especially at the knee, and protect the residual limb and to shape it. That's correct. Because what happens when it's, it swells up, has edema. So it has to be shaped appropriately for it to be fit well. The average time ranges anyway from five to 14 days and phantom limb pain can begin at this stage. And uh, so it's important to take that in consideration. This is deep. Yes. This is deep. And uh, as we, the immediate post-op care, what can be expected after the amputation, possible complications, do involve pain, infections, phantom limb sensations, phantom limb pain, edema, contractions, and psychological effects. Yes. And so that's where peer visits are very important, and being able to pull somebody out of that tunnel world that they're living in. 
I'm going to use that term a lot. Is that okay? That's fine. That's fine? Because yes. that, that's what I, re I, when I think of resilience, and that's what I'm thinking about. And Miss Linda, always, when she comes in, she'll be able to give us some points as well, feed us into this wonderful phenomenon. The goals of immediate post-op care are to facilitate healing, to stabilize and support tissue for more conducive healing, and we do not want to constrict proximal thigh. That's right. We want to maintain as much vascular flow to the limb. Like you said, the pump. We have mm -hmm. to keep those pathways open for mm -hmm. vascularization, to pump oxygen, to pump nutrients to the residual limb, mm -hmm. to facilitate healing. Yes, and not only that, we also have to prevent edema from accumulating, of course, the elevation, the compression, the wound drain and vac as needed, and medications as needed. It's very important because we're dealing with somebody who's hurting and who is in pain, and we, and we cannot minimize pain and say, well, but most likely, as uh, we, we t less edema, they say less pain. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. The more swollen it is, the, the more it can hurt. One thing I wanted to add too, doctor, is uh, uh -huh. from living it, mm -hmm. um, also, you know, turning your patient is very important. Turning, okay. And the bed, type of bed that you have in the hospital is very mm -hmm. important. The type of bed that you have at home is very important uh -huh. because sinking in your bed can actually cut off your circulation. Then it increases your pain. So air mattresses, mm -hmm. um, any type of device so you get the patient and the person can turn themselves, mm -hmm. I highly recommend that as well. Great, great. And uh, the, the idea, the goal is to create a functional residual limb, provide some shaping of the limb while facilitating edema control, and also to protect it and to protect the surgical site. Very important. Right. Okay. And, um, well, I'm going to have to give, the, give it to you now. Okay. Well, let's go from here. Let's uh, start talking about the actual prosthetic devices that are fit in the hospital before discharge. And so we have these different devices and we're going to talk about some of those today and we can have some samples we can talk about. So immediately after the amputation, we have a sterile dressing on the residual limb applied in the operating room and we want to maintain those dressings so they don't fall off. Typically, your patient will be fit with a device called a post-op sock. And this device is a small sock that can be rolled on over the residual limb. And the goal of this sock is to maintain the dressings intact and to maintain a sterile environment. And it just protects the residual limb. There's no compression for this. This is mostly just for the residual limb uh, sterile garments and dressings. Once the patient post-op day one or two has stabilized and their pain is managed with pain medications and elevation, then we can start introducing compression, either ACE bandage wraps, mm -hmm. which are applied by nursing or mm -hmm. therapy, and making sure that we apply those correctly. Or a prosthetist can come and provide a compression garment called a shrinker. That's the term that's specific for shrinker. prosthetics, a shrinker. It's a compression garment that is specific to an amputated residual limb. And this is applied on the limb and is sized correctly to provide appropriate compression and reflected for a double layer. There are many different kinds of shrinkers that are used in prosthetic care. Another device that we use mm -hmm. is something called a rigid removable dressing. And the goal of this is to protect the limb, to keep it from being harmed by outside forces, especially when transferring the patient or if the patient is using a mobility aid in the hospital, going to the bathroom or with therapy to protect the limb in an incidental fall. It also helps to manage knee extension so we don't develop a contracture in below the knee amputations and also helps to begin shaping the limb and providing some compression to prepare the limb for a prosthesis fitting. Another type of dressing is an immediate postoperative prosthesis and these are applied in a very controlled setting where physical therapy is in charge along with a physical medicine rehabilitation physician operating the program where the amputee, the person using a prosthesis, can stand post-op day two or three, immediately after their amputation, with controlled weight bearing per scale with a temporary prosthetic device and a temporary prosthetic foot. What this does is it uh, expedites the recovery time mm -hmm. and allows the individual to reduce those psychosocial mm -hmm. impacts of mm -hmm. their loss and their right. functional limitations. Mm -hmm. On the second or third day after surgery, they're already standing. So they're already re reducing their contracture risks. Mm -hmm. Their psychosocial risks are reduced. The residual limb is already being conditioned for weight bearing in a controlled environment to expedite mm -hmm. healing mm -hmm. and ambulation. 
Next slide, please. So we talk about the soft dressings, specifically the ACE bandage wraps. These are readily available, very affordable. They're available to all operating rooms and on the floors with nursing and all the rehab facilities. These are, can, can be applied by anyone. Just make sure they are applied correctly using the correct uh, format of applying an ACE wrap. We don't want to apply a tourniquet effect. We want to cover the residual limb evenly with even compression. The problem with these is they have to be reapplied several times throughout the day. Next slide. That's when a device like the shrinker is applied because it is consistent compression regardless of who puts this on. Mm -hmm. The patient themselves can put this device on if they can tolerate that. And it is sized correctly so that it doesn't depend on who's applying the shrinker. You have reduced effects of roping or tourniquet effects. The rigid removable dressing are some products that look like this and we have a sample here as well. And these devices protect the limb. So the limb would be inside of this device and it protects the residual limb from any outside forces. If the individual accidentally falls, there's a cushion in the bottom of the device mm -hmm. that helps to protect the residual limb. Mm -hmm. It also, the kneecap goes right here. It helps to prevent a knee flexion contracture by maintaining knee extension. Very, very important to maintain a patient's residual limb health and stability and contracture management with edema compression management. These are the advantages, everything we just talked about. Reducing injuries, reducing risks for contracture, accidental falls, uh, and expedited rehab time with shaping of the residual limb. I'd like to add one more, and mm -hmm. that's actually getting uh, conditioned uh, of the weight of the prosthesis. It helps gradually get you ready for that. Oh, that's a great point. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. So having a device on the residual limb starts to do some rehab or therapy for the muscles involved because of the added weight. Yes. Very good point. Thank you. Cool. Amazing. Next slide. This is an example of an immediate postoperative prosthesis, and this is the least common because it requires such an intensive, controlled therapy setting with a physical therapist and a physical medicine rehabilitation physician on staff to control weight bearing. There are many advantages to ambulating early and starting to compress the limb, psychosocial, expediting healing of the limb. Mm -hmm. However, there are some disadvantages that we have here on the slide. There are possibly injurious effects. If the individual puts too much weight through this system too soon, they could compromise the surgical site of the residual limb. And that's why it's so important to have a therapist that manages weight bearing per scale to ensure that that risk is not a problem. This also limits access to the surgical site in an urgent event. There are more layers, more options, uh, things that have to be removed to get to the residual limb and the, and the uh, injury. The potential for tissue damage is there just by excessive compression inside of the device and this lack of access to the inside. So immediate postoperative prostheses have to be controlled, very controlled if mm -hmm. they're used. Next slide. Now we'd like to talk about patient advocacy once again, and it is important to involve a patient advocate, someone who's lived with a prosthesis to come and talk to these individuals that have suffered limb loss in the hospital. Education is key, involving the family. And now I'd like to throw to Thomas Bourgeois, one of our patient advocates who has a message for us. Good morning, my name is Thomas Bourgeois and I was really excited when Dr. Edwards called and asked me to participate in this program this morning. Shortly after I was born, I was diagnosed with fibula hemimilia. I was born without my right fibula. I get asked every day, how did you lose your leg? Were you in the service? Were you in a car wreck? And my answer is always the same. I tell people I was lucky to be born without my leg. See, I was lucky my parents ignored the loving mistake my grandparents made when they raised my aunt, my mom's older sister, who was born with a paralyzed forearm, wrist and hand to be so dependent, she never moved out of the house. I was really lucky my parents ignored the first five orthopedic surgeons who said, your son's going to be in a wheelchair till he's six or seven years of age. Maybe we'll be able to do something at that point. My parents were resilient. They were resourceful and they kept looking. They found Dr. Charles Rockwood in San Antonio who performed an amputation at 10 and a half months of age. And I walked one month later at 11 and a half months of age. 
I was very lucky to be born the youngest of five kids. My four siblings, one sister and three brothers, physically pulled me up. If I wanted to play three on three with my older brothers and their friends, I had to beat one of them off the court or I didn't get any playing time. So if I would have been the oldest, I would have gravitated down physically. And I'm also very lucky that um, in 1991, January 17th, the day the aerial bombardment started in Baghdad, I was stuck at the Denver airport for six hours. I picked up a Sports Illustrated and I read an article about Diana Golden, a below the knee Paralympic skier. I was 24 years of age. I'd competed in able body sports all my life and I'd never heard about the Paralympic Games. I got back to Texas and I did my research and I found out there was a whole summer side to the Paralympics. 18 months later, they were gonna be held in Barcelona, Spain and I wanted to go. So I got coaches, I got training, I got in shape, and I went to the Paralympic trials in 1992 in Atlanta, Georgia at Emory University. I competed, I got second in the pentathlon. The pentathlon is five events all in one day. It's the long jump followed by the shot put, the 100 meter, the discus, and then about 9.45 at night, we run the 400 meters. I competed in Barcelona, I competed in 1996 in Atlanta, and I finished my career in Sydney, Australia, representing the United States in 2000. I was lucky. I made three Paralympic teams, three world teams, won four Paralympic medals, and I don't think that would have happened if I had two legs. So when people ask me, how did I lose my leg? I tell them I was lucky. Yeah, there was some hard work, and I had to be resilient, resourceful, and work hard but I wouldn't change a thing. Technology today is amazing. We have legs that give you back 95% return as opposed to 10% return. Like I had as a child, you have legs that are held on by vacuum. There's microprocessors and feet and knees now. You can control devices with apps on your smartphone. There's never been a better time to be an amputee than today. It truly is amazing. I have a passion for patient outcomes and patient education and if you have somebody that's struggling with limb loss, please call me. I can partner with you and we can provide them resources for life with limb loss and achieve the most ultimate outcome possible. What follows now is a 14 minute video that CBS produced of my 1996 Paralympic performance. I truly hope you enjoy it. At the end, you'll see my contact information. Don't hesitate to call me if you have somebody that's struggling with life with limb loss. I'll help them. Thank you and enjoy your day. In the Paralympic Games to date, we have watched the efforts of 3,500 athletes from 120 countries. First, it's the long jump in the same sand where Carl Lewis won gold. The Americans have quite a duo in the pentathlon. Thomas Bourgeois is the world record holder. Born without the lower right leg's longest bone, his parents heeded medical advice and had it cut off when he was 10 and a half months old. I just need to be relaxed and do my best and let the chips fall where they may. I'm not gonna watch Kurt throw. I'm not gonna watch Erst Collie jump. I'm not gonna, I, I, Thomas Bourgeois, you're up. I get up, I relax, I focus, I see what I have to do. I do what I do in practice. And at the end of the day, they get a calculator out. If I have more points than anybody else, I'll accept the gold medal. Kirk Collier has been chasing Bourgeois since he started this three years ago. A little better than 15 feet. Something for Bourgeois to go after this time. Bourgeois first learned about the Paralympics from an article in Sports Illustrated that it inspired him to get here. Well, that's powerful writing. His second jump is farther than anyone else's, just over 16 feet. The next challenge in the pentathlon is the shot put. To prepare, Team USA changes sneakers and legs. In the pentathlon, it's time to see whose upper body can join with a dance step of the lower part and heave one of these. Gentlemen, take your best shot. 
In an event that can trace its origins to the very beginnings of sport, bourgeois is aided by the most high-tech of aids. Graphite, shock absorbers, the latest. This event is the best of three throws, and this is his first. Forty feet, nine and three quarter inches. That's the longest so far. The American duo came out of the shot put shining in second and third. So nine seconds. Unglamorously, Bourgeois falls, recovers. He and Collier finish third and fourth. And I'll ask me, I'm not going to kid anybody. I'm not a true sprinter. These short legs, I do what I can. And I got to the tape, and I was a little before the tape, and I leaned off my sound side. And if I would have put this leg down like this, the chance for hyperextension is just too great. And you don't think about that, but your body won't allow you to, to do that. Thomas Bourgeois from San Antonio needs a Texas-sized result. Win by six seconds for the gold. Daunting, but knowledge of challenge is something that there is a lot of around here. But there is to be no huge win, no giving in by the Swiss, no missteps, no openings. Bourgeois is a silver medalist who just can't stand it. We did our best today, and, and that's what it's about. And Urs Kali is a phenomenal athlete. He's set a world record uh, probably here in the pen and also in the uh, open, disc, uh, open long jump, jumping 19 feet off one leg. It's amazing. And uh, to be second or third behind Urs Kali, it's an easy pill to swallow because he's a phenomenal athlete and a gentleman. It is times like this where things are said, like you win a silver medal, you don't lose one. Same true for bronze. And the reason those things are said is because they fit the same way these extraordinary efforts fit under the torch. What a wonderful message from Thomas Bourgeois. That's a great idea of loss, overcoming, and resiliency. Look what he's accomplished. That was really an amazing story. Yes, it was. That story is amazing. It is truly amazing. I did not know that about Thomas until recently. Yes. And you did not even tell me about it. But <laughs> you had something else to add on to what we were talking about earlier. Refresh my memory. It Dr. was Rivers. about the post-acute stage. That's right. We're going to jump right back into our presentation. So the post-acute stage begins with a hospital discharge. This is when things get real because the patient has to be prepared. Things, provisions have to be placed so that the patient can be taken care of once they leave the facility. Yes. They're going to be discharged to either rehabilitation facility or skilled nursing facility or to home mm -hmm. with outpatient therapy or to home with home health therapy. And Mr. Blasini is going to talk to us about that in a little yes. bit. There's also contracture management. So the mm -hmm. patients have to have their homework from physical therapy that they leave the facility with mm -hmm. on maintaining residual limb mm -hmm. exercises, strength, mobility, and contracture management. This is also where continued healing of the residual limb is critical. They have to monitor the healing of the incision and report any complications back to the physician. They need to continue to assess the limb length and the shape and making sure that their post amputation dressings and devices are fitting correctly to continue healing the residual limb, which is necessary so they can get fit with a prosthesis. You have to have the limb completely healed before the prosthesis can be fit. So this is a very important critical stage. This is also very important about their psychosocial health. We need to continue to have peer support involved and make sure that those individuals with limb loss, this new traumatic event, have access to somebody that can help them cope and deal and bounce back from this mm -hmm. loss that they've had. So continued peer visit and patient education. Next slide. The contracture management for transtibial level is critical to maintain a functional residual limb for using a prosthesis. So in below the knee amputation can be managed by a device like a rigid removable dressing, but also for the individual to pay attention to not sleeping with a knee flexed or bent and to be cognizant of the limb staying straight and using range of motion. It's also important for a, above the knee amputees at the hip level. 
So maintaining their stretching and exercises, we like to call it tummy time, to make sure that we don't have a contracture of the hip flexing forward and transfemoral. Because when they're sitting in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. which is the safest mobility device immediately after amputation, the hip flexion contracture is very common, especially below the knee with the knee being bent sitting in a wheelchair. So these are things that are important for them to pay attention to. Next slide. Recovery stage continued. Preparing for prosthetic use. The residual limb has to be desensitized and conditioned. And we can do this by com towel compresses. So just lightly laying a towel over the residual limb, mm -hmm. uh, getting them used to contact on the end of the residual limb. And those nerves are sending out these feelers, this phantom limb sensation. So they're looking for feedback and some type of compress or contact helps to calm those nerves down and get the residual limb ready for contact. Using a light cotton swab, rubbing the incision when it's ready is another level of desensitization of the residual limb and massage of the limb, as long as it doesn't exhaust any discharge from the limb. And continued recovery stage is limb shaping. This is performed by compression wraps, like a shrinker, and their rigid removable device. The limb has to have an appropriate shape so it can be fit with a prosthesis. If the bottom of the limb is larger than the top of the limb, it is very difficult for the individual to place their limb inside of a prosthetic device. So this rigid removal dressing and shrinker helps to shape this limb while it's reducing edema, and that's why this is important. Next slide. In recovery stage, it is so important to maintain muscle strength and function and range of motion. The goals, of course, are set by physical therapy under the direction of the physical medicine rehabilitation doctor and are continued home with their homework. They have to work on their balance and coordination because now they have single limb support. They are only using one limb in a lower limb amputation. And now their center of mass, their body weight, has to be centered over the remaining foot, which is their base of support. Those are some critical terms here. Center of mass, base of support. That's how we create stability and reduce falls. So what you're telling me, I hear about recruitment here. What, what, what's your thought on that? Recruitment, because we're talking about muscle strength in order to compensate for a loss. Yes. So your body will compensate and use other, the other uh, portions of your body to, mm -hmm. to get the job done. So finding your new core balance is very important. Core strength, balance, mobility, mm -hmm. all these things will come into play with practice. So what you mean to say if somebody has an amputation, simply putting on a prosthesis is not going to cut it if they're weak. And Correct. And their hands weaken their shoulders. Right, exactly. Post-op, post you become weak. Uh -huh. So you have to regain your strength mm -hmm. and your endurance is huge in regards to moving forward with the prosthesis because of the en energy use that you have to uh, compensate for. Okay. So you have to build yourself up even more than what you were before. Oh, going back to the concept of unity in terms of, you remember the tunnel vision that we're trying to avoid? I can do it myself and I don't need anybody, I don't need any, I don't need any help, and I can do this. Or the other extreme doctor is, mm -hmm. I can't do it. Ooh, okay. So that's, that's the big piece of utilizing the team approach mm -hmm. to connect with that individual to say you can do it. And you, utilizing the peer support person to help say, I am doing it. And making it all come together for them. Oh, great. So you, you, have you seen some ampu people with the, uh, the amputations say, oh, well, you, you are one. You can testify yes. to this. The opposite end that you talked about. Correct. I so, can do it, but they are not quite They've not grasped it. Or well, the extreme is they can't do it, and they, they need someone to help them s learn that they can by showing them, by doing it, and living it, and then they, they attach to it. They attach to the plan. Resiliency. Resiliency. Bouncing Resil back. Bouncing back. Using the team's resources. I love it. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Other considerations when an individual is discharged from a hospital to make sure that they stay safe and they have the equipment that they need. We need to, once again, patient-centric. It's about the patient. Put yourself in their shoes. What would they need when they go home? There's several things, mm -hmm. several things. That's why we have this team. So home safety. It's huge. Um, being, being an amputee myself and going through the whole process, the team really comes into the arena 
uh, from different perspectives. And the, the physical therapist, occupational therapist comes in from a different angle of what the, the individual may need at the house. Um, the, the missing element that's really important to all this too is the case management team. So you have nurse case managers, uh, social work case managers, and they do a needs assessment as well. Well, what does your house look like? How many steps do you have to your front door? Do you have an access to get out if there's a fire? What's your lighting situation? How many pets do you have? Do you have throw rugs on the floor? Um, how many, how many um, stairs do you have to go to the second story? All these things are, are variables that can cause injury. Mm -hmm. So by assessing the needs, a home assessment, they could send a therapist out to the home and really look at it. I like utilizing the phone because you can take pictures of the person's bathroom. Oh, well, we recommend that you get some handrails in the shower, for example, or a bathtub, tub transfer board, um, the, the toilet, three-in-one bedside commode. All these things can help with the independence or the modified independence and the safety to getting that individual back to a new norm. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. That is not something that I think any prosthetist really mm -hmm. considers. Mm -hmm. So prosthetists can sometimes have tunnel vision, and that's why the team is very important for realizing all the different objectives that are needing to be considered to keep that patient safe and to bounce back. Yes. I'd like to now hand over to Mr. Dan Blasini, who is going to talk to us about his personal story of resiliency. And we have some pictures up here that are just a snapshot uh, briefly into Dan's life pre and post amputation through his traumatic event. Dan, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. It's my honor to be here. I wanted to talk about um, the overall experience that I had prior becoming an amputee and what I've done beyond the amputation with uh, a, a new outlook on life and the total recovery. Every day is a recovery process, in, in my opinion. Uh, that's because it has to do with new challenges uh, uh, every day that you, you get exposed to. So the big prep is really starting off um, being prior service in the military. I was exposed to uh, different situations and conditions mm -hmm. uh, all over the world, and that gave me an overhaul uh, look about uh, life in general and the, the, the fraternity of doing something greater than yourself and being part of something that is greater than yourself and actually covering your fellow service member uh, and uh, making sure that you have what we call in the military having their six, which is their back. Uh, and, and being exposed to that, the Army was very good to me in regards of prepping me for that, but also helped me with my college education. So they actually sent me to, to nursing school, and I've got a few degrees uh, with, with the thanks of uh, Uncle Sam and, and the military, so I appreciate that. And I have gratitude, and I want to pass that forward pass that knowledge forward, pass the experience forward, pass the, um, the overall community support forward based on what I was uh, uh, given. And that's my way to give back to, to, to society. Mm -hmm. Having that experience, I was given a, a great opportunity during the war to work at uh, Fort Sam at, at the Center for the Intrepid, which is a very awesome outpatient rehab center uh, worldwide known. And I've actually uh, case managed as a nurse about 477 um, individuals that had amputations or burns during my tenure there. And I thought as a professional, I was teaching them what to do and I was kind of biased in certain things and, and had my tunnel vision, if you will. But I found out later on that those individuals were actually prepping me for my new chapter in my life. So this is all led up to mm -hmm. prior to your traumatic event. Correct. I see. So okay. the wisdom that I, I was obtaining through every single person, I totally believe that someone comes into your life to teach you one thing and you may never see them again. Sometimes you become connected and you see them all the time. Sometimes they just want to teach you that story and move on. So you have to be open to the good, the bad, and the ugly in regards to learning all these things that, that you're going to be thrown at you. So about six years ago, I was on my motorcycle and uh, I was actually in a, in a motor vehicle accident and I got hit 
and things happened, and that was a life-changing experience for me. Uh, but I actually, because of my knowledge base, it really helped me overcome things faster. I was at a point where, um, because of the experience, I actually went into the ER and I said, give me a myodesis six inches below the patella to the, to the ER ortho trauma team. And they're like, who are you? Nobody knows that. <laughs> they're, they're, they're through radars. Uh, well, who are, you know, and they were asking me questions and I was naming off team members and the whole nine yards. I'm like, I know your boss. And so um, it re really worked out very um, interesting for the trauma team and myself. Uh, but the backbone behind all of that, who had my six was my family. My spouse, my kids, um, immediate family was great in regards to advocating for me uh, because you know I was under a lot of medications at the time. Um, so they they stepped up. They kind of knew if something bad happened, my approach to things of what what I would uh, need to get better. So that all happened, and it played out very mm -hmm. systematic. So I was able to go from inpatient recovery and uh, pre-op care, and and that took a couple days before they decided to amputate. Um, but when that happened, I was ready to go, get up and go. Uh, in fact, a little bit too quick, uh, because I knew that I wanted to get out of bed as, as quickly as possible. How did you do that? I mean, really, you're about to lose a leg, and you know it. Yeah, it was my choice. Okay, there's a crisis. You've yes. hit a crisis point. Yes. And now, I, you, you told me sometime, cut it. Is that what you told him? Yes. I just said, cut it. Take it off How right do now. you resolve? Because we talk, some people are listening to us and wondering. They've hit a crisis point in their lives. Yes. It could be an amputation. It could be a diagnosis. Sure. Yes. It could be anything. They've hit a crisis point. How do you go from that point of, oh, my God, I've been hit with a crisis point. I'm melting. Now, resilience has to come into play and for you to bounce back. How did you get there? It was through the experience of working with people um, with technology, working mm -hmm. with the prosthetists in, in, in my arena, working with the physicians, working with the tools and seeing the tools that people had. So you had an advantage. I had a great advantage because I saw the quality of life people had with using a prosthesis. So it was my choice to say, I want that prosthesis because I know I can function with that. I know I can provide for my family for that. Uh -huh. I didn't want it. Gotcha. I wanted my own independence. So you didn't have that typical tunnel vision that somebody else would have who has not been exposed, pre-exposed pre to. Exposure was the key in my story. Mm -hmm. And that's the over, so to, to overcome that, doctor, mm -hmm. we have to teach that story to others. So, and that's done through education and support. Mm -hmm and the group coming together mm -hmm. to help them make that decision. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, it's, it's a limb, limb loss recovery process, mm -hmm. and that can take anywhere from six months to 18 months, and you still may have an outcome of taking the leg anyway. Right. So when I, when I had that conversation with the physicians, for me, my personal story was, I'm too pretty. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, well, I don't want you to take a bone out of my hip and skin off my leg. And, and then I have all these scars. I said, no, I just want, just take the leg and we'll get a prosthesis and we'll roll. And that's what happened. So they, they said, okay, let's, let's do it. Uh, so, you know, post-op was, I woke up and it was gone. I was swollen, like unbelievable. That was my biggest concern because um, when you do get an amputation, they have to reroute your, your um, vascular system mm -hmm. and your body has to compensate. Mm -hmm. So you kind of retain water. So it's very good to have that open communication and I, they use different techniques with diuretics and all kinds of things that help me um, pull off that water rate. So this start shaping the leg and for me to breathe better and for me to ambulate. And, uh, you know, with, with a walker right off the bat. And no neuromas. What's a neuroma? Ah, a neuroma. <laughs> a bundle of nerves. A bundle of nerves, okay. That can form in the residual limb because the nerves are looking to do something. So mm -hmm. they've had this pathway that you've talked right. about. Mm -hmm. They've innervated a muscle. Mm -hmm. And now they have been cut and they're confused. They have a job yes. to do. They're going to report for duty no yes. matter what. Yes. So the nerves sometimes can create a bundle 
and mm -hmm. it becomes very sensitive. It mm -hmm. can become a problem for fitting right. of a prosthesis. Yes, and I've had to inject them. Did you develop, a, I put a needle in the residual limb and inject them? Yes. And uh, patients can, can do feel better yes. and they can progress. It you know? does, I did have one neuroma on uh, the lateral distal end uh -huh. of, of my amputation site and that the physician, the PMR physician did help me uh, with injections and that um, fixed the problem for me. Good. But I still have residual um, phantom pain and it feels like I, someone is pinching my Achilles tendon constantly at about a pressure of five out of 10. There's mirror therapy that uh, is done. Yes. For people who have lost a leg and it works. I've seen it work, I've used, utilized it. And that, did you use mirror therapy? I, I didn't. I. I I should, but in my it, it, but I, I didn't at the time. So mirror therapy is we know that when somebody loses a leg, the brain still thinks it has the leg. Yes, and it's mapped up in the brain. The leg is still there even when the leg is not there. Correct. So that causes a we call that sensitization issue, where we have to mirror therapy is they put a mirror in front of uh, somebody so that when you look at it, you try to appease the mind, so to speak, or the brain, that it's there, it's mapped, it's okay. So the, so it, it will stop the misfiring yes. of those nerves. And you still, no matter, no you matter know, this is do. six years later and right. I still can be sitting on a sofa and still get an electrical charge. You still feel your toes, yes. your foot. Like right now I can wiggle my toes. Amazing. Phantom limb. Phantom limb. It is real. It's real. So it's, it's burning pain. Some people, I, uh, I did treat, it's burning pain. They feel that the limb is on fire in, in some patients. Yes. They feel it and it's not to be ignored. They're not crazy. It's the Correct. brain that's still mapped. Yes. The leg is still mapped in the brain. Amazing. But medications did help. I, I was on mm -hmm. uh, Neurotin and mm -hmm. that did help me in the mm -hmm. beginning. Mm -hmm. And I utilize a little bit if I still have those phantom pains. Okay. Nice. Resilience. So you Resiliency. were able to adapt. Yes. Withstand. Yes. That you did, and you have, you still are. Yes. And overcome. Yes. And recover. Correct. And challenge yourself. For me, I, I've done everything um, from uh, uh, snorkeling uh, to flying a plane, to um, playing golf, to running a 5K, um, all types of things. So it's a matter of putting a challenge out there and hitting that and every day you come up with a new one and you just move forward in life because things are gonna get thrown at you and you're gonna to have to overcome. Preparation is the key. Having an outlook and projection of what's around you and your surroundings, mm -hmm. uh, very important. So when I go into the store, for example, mm -hmm. I literally put a cart in front of me because people don't know that I'm an amputee and they wanna stop dead right in front of me or reach in front of me. And I have to, I need a barrier to protect myself and to protect them. So I use the cart a lot to protect me. To protect you, great, great. Yeah, so, so what advice, there are some people, as, you, as I alluded to earlier, that don't have the res exposure to resources. I'm talking about a young veteran yes. who's, been, who's been at war in Iraq or wherever, has lost a limb, has no clue what's going on. You have somebody who's had a motorcycle accident like you did, or somebody who, for whatever reason, right. for, for vascular disease, they have limb loss. Resources are very important, doctor, in regards to community. There's nonprofit groups, for-profit groups, um, professional organizations, mm -hmm. um, different groups that you can belong to, mm -hmm. and everyone's connected, and everyone has a piece to this puzzle, and asking, no one's going to really come to you. You have to go out to them and ask for support. Okay. So can you look at the camera and tell people that you can do it? 100% you can do it. I, I totally believe that with the best tools, the best team, the best environment, not everything is going to be perfect, but you have to keep on working on it daily. Uh, the big thing is really supporting uh, your mind and your heart and moving forward with anything that comes in front of you in your path. So push yourself, the team will push you, mm -hmm. work every day on a goal and make it bigger than yourself. Uh, my big thing in learning in this process is I relate it to a bridge. Mm -hmm. When I take care of my patients, I look at 
why do I have to go over that bridge? So my focus isn't the bridge anymore, it's the patient beyond the bridge. <laughs> so I lock in on that. That's a wonderful analogy. <laughs> and keep on going. So that, that's what I, I highly recommend for all the- Resiliency at work. Yes. In somebody who has had limb loss. Yes. What a story. Preparation. Prep your day, set everything out, start your goals from the minute you wake up, Make your bed, move on. Plan it out, write it out, and do it. You wouldn't believe what a checklist will do. Creating a checklist for me is very important every day. And I will list eight things that I must do that day. Sometimes I hit seven, sometimes I hit eight, sometimes I hit four, but that becomes my list the next day. And I'd like to add with prosthetics, if there's something on the list that you're not able to accomplish, you gotta involve the team. Goals change. Your priorities change. A prosthesis is a static device. Your goals, your ambitions, your drive is dynamic. It changes. So getting into the prosthetist on a regular basis to have the prosthesis either updated or changed to meet your new goals, because this once again is patient-centric. It's all about the individual with limb loss and what their goals are. Making sure that they have the right tools to accomplish their goals that they're setting for them using this team of interdisciplinary care. Correct, and also you're gonna have, once you start moving and getting in shape and you're going to have uh, residual limb changes or atrophy within that limb which is shrinking of the limb so you have to work with your processes you have to have a good communication you have to use different uh, socks or liners or devices or um, to make sure that you can still function safely so that's that's open communication all the mm -hmm. time with yes. the members of your team absolutely Great. quite that's important and when the patient comes to see me and uh, has uh, issues of pain, uh, cannot sleep at night, or has fallen out of bed because they forgot they have a limb loss, and all these other things that go along with, I, I don't know if I can do it. Yes, you can. My, my, my goal is to tell them that they can do it. Yes. And to tell them that this is possible through this team approach that we've adopted. We can do it. Oh, you need to go see him now so that way you can fix the, uh, the changes with, that have to do with the them changes now has become less edematous, and maybe we need to make an adjustment. That's correct. On, on that. I love all that. Uh -huh. One of the things that helped me go through this whole process was my role as a husband, my role as a father, my role as a provider, mm -hmm. my role it changed. I did not want to be a, a victim. I wanted to be a victor. Oh, like oh wonderful. So I have other people depending on me and I have to think and plan and orchestrate and work the plan every day to support their needs, which is bigger than me. So I put them ahead of me. And who had to get you out of that tunnel? You didn't get into tunnel solitude. I saw it through the education of working with all the other family members. So I call it the trauma, the drama, and the mama. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I'll working, remember that. Working that whole process, right. making sure that the family's involved, because mm -hmm. the family and the spouse or your significant other has to buy mm -hmm. into the plan as well. If you don't buy into the plan, there's going to be resistance, and resistance causes pain, and pain causes issues, noncompliance. All these things come in the factor. So having a great uh, backbone, having a great family support and friend support, when I was injured, my friends that came came out of the woodwork to come support me, come visit me, uh, they 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 showed their love in different ways. Sometimes it was food, sometimes it was sitting there for hours, sometimes bringing me a bear to hug, and all kinds of things that I saw. Very great for sh taking me to the next level, mm -hmm. getting focused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's all awesome, but when it really comes down to it, you're doing it not only for yourself but it's for other people. You have to live. Talk to talk and walk to walk. Okay. Literally. Are there other things that you took for granted and now you find that, for instance, you, you don't have a leg. Yes. You have to get into a car and drive. And you, you, you finally realize, I cannot do that. It depends on what side you are. Uh -huh. um, but there are devices, if I lost my right leg, uh -huh. there are pedals that can fit. And everything that we talked about from the home... Uh, modifications can be bought online. That's a, that's the greatest thing about our new technology. <laughs> so it, you can go on Amazon and pretty much buy everything that you need for your house and your car mm -hmm. to make it safe to use, right. highly functional. So you can become 
independent, modified independent to do what you have to do, not depend on others to take me to therapy. I went on my own. You drove yourself to drove therapy. Drove myself to therapy. So I rented um, a vehicle with a ramp to roll myself in, right. then transferred into the, the minivan and then went to therapy every day. You know, what? One, in th one story that Dan told me was when he flew a plane. Yes. You flew a, pa a, a plane. A Cessna. With one leg. Yes. The pilot asked you, what did the pilot ask you? No, I'm thinking about this. In a plane, you have to use hands and feet. Yes. Correct. Okay. I'm putting this together now. Yes. I'm, I'm paying attention. Yes. So I, it, was in, it was in Texas, and I didn't tell the, the pilot, the instructor pilot, that I was an amputee. But it was my goal for a few reasons to, to one, overcome height issues that I had. And then I wanted to overcome the the potential of flying the plane because that was a goal of mine. So we went through, and he says, "Oh, I want you to taxi on the on the runway." And I said, "No problem." So he goes, "Okay, make a right on on 13 um, right here, and, and, and we'll get set up to take off." But I couldn't dorsiflex, so I couldn't steer the plane. Dorsiflex with your foot. With my foot. Because, because you because you have a prosthesis. Right. On my left side I couldn't make that right. left to get to get on the runway. So I said, Oh, you might want to take this part right here and I kinda of talked my way out of it. Uh, so we lined up and took off and I actually floored it and we took off and we had a great flight. I flew around for about forty five minutes. He landed the plane, but I had so much admiration for pilots because I, I, I noticed and was experienced all the technology, all the wisdom, all the rules and regulations and policies and guidelines, everything is coming at you simultaneously. And I have, for pilots, I have, I'm like, wow. And I can't imagine going, you know, Mach 1, Mach 2 in a fighter jet and everything flying that fast in your brain and making things happen with your body. So I did fly. Uh, he landed. And it was a great flight, great experience. And he goes, well, you had problems with that left hair. And I go, yeah, yeah, I had problems. With and then I pulled my pants leg up, and I go, this is why. He started shaking his head. He's like, wow, I couldn't believe that you did that to me. And I said, well, you know, I just wanted to check it out and see what I can do or can't do. But we're here. And he started laughing. He goes, but you got to get cleared by the physician. <laughs> before and, we go back up. <laughs> yeah, before we go back. But I learned. Uh, but. Uh -huh. Adapting Adapted. was was the lesson. Right. So I learned. I said, "Well, I can't fly a Cessna." He goes, "Ah, but you could fly a Piper, because that you don't have the foot pedals." And I was like, well, "Then my there license go. go to Piper." So your so, goal didn't change. You didn't stop what your goal and your ambitions were. Correct. You used resources yes. and technology yes. to enable yourself. Correct. What a great message. Good job. Correct. That's wonderful to hear. <sighs> Resiliency. Your, resiliency. <laughs> your, Thomas's story and your story just are amazing and awesome. And somebody out there is listening to this. Yeah, and no. whatever crisis they have, a limb loss or anything for that matter, there is a better chapter ahead. Yes, it's a new chapter. The wisdom that I obtained from the amputation and everyone I was exposed to prior to the amputation, mm -hmm. it's... I kind of wish I had that years ago. So I don't look at my loss as a negative. I look at it as a positive wisdom. That's what Tom. Experience. That's what Thomas told us. Yes. He regards yes. his congenital limb loss as a blessing. Yes, it's my blessing. So I have one foot in the grave. Twenty-five percent of me is gone, and every day I cherish. Every day. Every day. Every day. I cherish everything. Different outlook. Give me a <laughs> Team resiliency. Team, Team resiliency. Res <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. I think yeah. that finishes up our live session today. Uh -huh. I think we're going to be jumping to another message, and following will be a talk. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you all for joining us today. We'll have questions and answers at the end of our presentation. Stay tuned. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Hello, this is Mona Talukdar. I'm the owner and CEO of Seasons Alzheimer's Care and Assisted Living in San Antonio, Texas. I'm a physical therapist by profession. My desire to provide best possible care to my residents led me to add different services such as home health, hospice, and palliative care. My goal always has been to be there for my residents and my patients. 
My team and I have worked diligently to meet all our patient care needs. At my Alzheimer's facility, we provide affordable rates with highest staffing ratios and we can handle all kinds of behaviors. All Seasons Home Health provides skilled services at home. At Four Seasons Hospice, we meet the needs of our patients at end of their lives. In our new division, visiting practitioners, we send nurse practitioners and doctors directly to your home. If your loved ones need care at home, we can meet their needs. Call us today at 210-767-3870. Next, we're going to talk about the trauma side of lost limbs. And we'll be hearing from Tim Earnhardt and Laurel Ridge Treatment Center. We'll be teaching a comprehensive presentation on PTSD. Tim Earnhardt is licensed therapist with years of experience. Let's welcome him. Hello, uh, my name is Tim Earnhardt. I'm a licensed clinical social worker um, at, here at Laurel Ridge. Uh, so. Most recently, I've been working as a, a military liaison for the last two years. Prior to that, I was a trauma therapist uh, specializing in combat-related PTSD here at Laurel Ridge on our military unit. Um, so today, what I want to do is, is talk about PTSD, um, what it is, who's at risk for it, how to treat it, and even at the end, I want to get into some, maybe some positive aspects of what recovery looks like uh, from PTSD. Um, I got really interested in, in working with PTSD when um, I was in college. Um, my dad is a 29-year veteran of the armed services, um, and uh, he was in Vietnam uh, all the way to Iraq. Uh, his last deployment was 2004. Um, and he struggled you know, with PTSD on and off. I didn't really know a lot about it, but um, when I was in college, they, my family, him and my mom moved um, and really uprooted a lot of, he had very strict regiments in his life. Uh, he was an E9, um, so if anybody knows what E9 is, it's, uh, it's the highest enlisted you can be and uh, kind of in charge of, of the day-to-day -day operations of a unit. Um, so his life was very regimented, and when they moved he, and he retired, his life became unregimented, and uh, he really struggled. He, you know, he struggled with anxiety, he struggled with uh, some other things, um, and that really sparked my interest into how can someone, you know, kind of not struggle with symptoms, at least to my knowledge, for 20 plus, 25 plus years, and then all of a sudden have a resurgence. and so. Um, he called me and, and I, I told him, you can go to the VA. He went to the VA for what he calls a tune-up, um, three sessions of individual therapy and no medication, and, and he was good. And um, that's not the recommended treatment protocol for PTSD, but it, it somehow worked for him. Um, and he's you know, been, been good ever since. But um, that's what really sparked my interest. That's what sparked my passion into working with uh, PTSD and especially combat-related PTSD. Um, there are some similarities across whatever um, you know, triggered PTSD, and that's we're going to talk in generalities with that as well um, as we go through this presentation. Um, I'm going to really go over what PTSD is, risk factors, um, what memory processing is. Um, so how do we like go from like a restaurant or people not being a trigger to being a trigger to, to activating PTSD uh, symptoms and responses, what that looks like in the brain. And then we're gonna go over uh, treatment um, and we're gonna stick with evidence-based treatments. There's a lot of things outside of these three that people do to treat PTSD, um, and, but they're really ancillary. There's not a lot of evidence that they're um, effective. And so the DOD allows three treatments, um, prolonged exposure, CPT, and EMDR. We'll get into those. Um, we'll talk about managing flashbacks, and we'll even talk about some benefits of going through a, a struggle, going through a difficult situation, and how that can even improve your life going forward. And here, the learning objectives. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on those. Um, so here, I, I, we'll get started with um, what PTSD is and what it isn't. And so you can have a trauma, you can go through a very hard, unexpected event um, that's difficult, that disrupts your life. 
um, without developing PTSD. Um, so we, have a tr we can have a trauma event. Maybe it's a singular event. Maybe there's a couple events. Um, but there's a difference between that trauma event and developing PTSD. Um, the biggest one is the subjectivity versus objectivity. So, like my daughter, she'll be like, yeah, I had a test today. That was very, that was a, I think I have PTSD from that test. You know, which is, is not, I try to explain to her like, okay, honey, like this is what I do for a living. It's not PTSD, but she doesn't really understand it. And PTSD has kind of become part of our vocabulary, like our everyday kind of like we talk about it. And what most people are talking about is one, like just hard events, like taking a test. But even so, like, um, I'll give you an example from my life. So I was biking, I like to bike a lot and I was commuting to work um, like all year round up in Minnesota. I crashed on my bike, uh, flew into the street, broke my collarbone and my thumb, cracked my helmet in half, um, had to go to the ER and, and all that stuff. Um, and so six weeks I was just in a brace. I couldn't ride bike anymore or anything like that. Um, after I got my brace off, I decided, well, I'm gonna ride bike again. Now I'm gonna start commuting to work again. And I remember the first time I got on my bike, I like had a, a rush of anxiety and I saw the road when I crashed, like I could see the, like the rocks in the road. And I, was, I had to step off my bike and I was like, oh wow, like this is crazy. Like what's happening, you know? And I had to take a minute and I was like, okay, like take a deep breath. And I got back on my bike, bike, no disruption after that. Um, so if you look at this slide, PTSD and trauma, they overlap. It was definitely disruptive. It felt overwhelming at the time. And I had a, like a sense of uh, like safety on my bike it was not there, right? But I just went out and did it and I never had any, I don't even think about that anymore. And actually my wife gets on me about wearing a bike helmet now because <laughs> I sometimes forget to wear one. <laughs> So PTSD is it's long, it's how we respond over an extended amount of time to stimulus, okay? And so if you think about if maybe if I would have developed PTSD from that event, um, every time I got on my bike, I would have had a, some a, like a stimulus, a reaction. I wouldn't have been able to like go on a road or I, I wouldn't have probably been able to bike or would have caused great disruption in my life. Um, the diagnosis is, uh, if we're following like what the DSM says, um, you really can only have a, a legit PTSD diagnosis three months post-trauma. And so that's 90 days after the initial event. So this really contradicts, contradicts like, like what best practices are as far as like, they say like you have the better, best outcomes and, and it's, evidence-based, you have the best outcomes the sooner you get into PTSD treatment. And so you can have PTSD treatment without having the, the full diagnosis. However, most clinicians will diagnose people with PTSD inside of that three months. And then the objective piece, and that's just we have evidence-based uh, symptomology broken down into five different parts. Um, that, so we're, we're getting rid of our own sense of what we think PTSD is and we try to focus on the evidence for what it is um, with research. All right, so here are some like just warning signs or people that, things that make you at risk uh, for developing PTSD. Um, one of the more interesting things that I found out in working with combat um, survivors is combat is actually a poor indication of PTSD. Um, more people, in combat, I'm talking about like active engagement, like um, firefight, um, like IED explosion, um, stuff like that. That's combat, um, the way that we're defining it here. Um, more people and a higher percentage of people get combat or deployment related PTSD by just being deployed than actually that are in like engaged with an enemy in combat. And there's a bunch of different ideas of why that is. Um, probably the most valid one is if you're engaged in combat, you have some autonomy over what happens. So if you're just on a base and you're just getting mortared like day in and day out, 
Um, or you know, if you're constantly seeing casualty after casualty after casualty, um, you don't have a lot of autonomy in the outcome of that. Um, you know, and I've worked with uh, you know, like doctors and, and medics, and, and um, they have a certain autonomy, like dis- they can decide how the outcome is or based on medical procedures, but a lot of times there's no way that that, per- that person can be saved, but they'll take on that responsibility anyway. Um, and so that's a, you know, a difficult thing where when you're re- in combat, you have autonomy over your decisions. Um, the rates of deployed service members, PTSD has risen. Um, it's actually higher than Vietnam than our most recent conflict. Um, the, the couple of the things though that I want to hit on is the brain is hardwired to anticipate and react to threat. Um, so that's our survival instinct, right? Um, and we have a whole bunch of automatic systems in our body that react when we feel like we're under threat. And so we have all these threat detection systems, and we're going to talk more about those, the amygdala and the hippocampus. Um, so we're, we're hardwired to protect against that. The problem with our society right now is that we're moving so fast, and everything feels like a threat because of the pace, and we're not getting a break from like the anxiety. So now the pickup line at your kid's school can feel threatening, right? Because you feel anxiety, there's all these people, there's things running around, you gotta get to the next thing, so you're feeling stressed. And what's happening is that stuff like that is triggering that threat response, that survival instinct. Um, And we're never getting a respite from that. So it's like we're always pushing the gas pedal and, and going. So then when something like a car accident happens or um, an assault, you know, we're already like kind of on that threat. So this just adds another layer to that threat response. Um, anyone can get PTSD. Uh, you know, that's, uh, it's just, a lot of it is how much trauma you go through, um, how you were raised. Um, there's some biological components to PTSD. We're going to talk about those as we get into this too, uh, in regards to epigenetics. Um, and 25% of people that are exposed to the same situation will get will develop PTSD, uh, which is kind of interesting. And a lot of that does have to do with biology. A lot of it has to do with how much trauma you've gone through. Um, like I'm going to reference like combat. Um, somebody that's been deployed seven times into a combat zone, on the eighth time, they're much more likely to develop PTSD or, and symptoms than somebody that is it's their second or third time. Um, and one thing in treating PTSD, um, and I've found that, especially like with assaults and things like that, people feel like it's their fault. Like um, they, they should have did something different or they should have fought harder or they should have not you know, walked down that street. And then they have these symptoms and they feel like cra- they're crazy, like there's nothing they can do. And one thing that we really focus on is education. So we, we educate what PTSD is, um, what it actually is, that it's not like a, a shortcoming in your, who you are as a human, who you are as a person. Um, it just means that like there's something going on in your brain, and there's something going on in your nervous system that just needs to be addressed. So this slide is, a, is a kind of a, I'm not going to get into the DSM-5, um, like all the diagnostic criteria, because I don't think that's necessary for you all to know that. Um, so I kind of just put together an overview of, of what the signs of, of PTSD is. And the, these are, these five categories, there are categories in the DSM. Um, and so this is where we're talking about, like, this isn't like, just something that we kind of say, oh, you must have PTSD because you experienced this. Um, what, the biggest ones uh, for like re-experiencing, so you have to have re-experiencing to, have, to be diagnosed with PTSD. So if you don't have any re-experiencing, um, we have to start looking at maybe it's something else. So maybe it is a single incident trauma. Maybe it's something like moral injury. Um, I didn't get into moral injury, but a real quick definition of moral injury is doing something or not doing something that violates your moral or ethical code. Um, And so you can get into a lot of that, like in a car accident, you know, someone may not have re-experiencing, but let's say someone got seriously injured 
and you know they feel like man if I wouldn't have been going five miles over if I didn't glance at my cell phone uh, that never would have happened um, that's a that would be a moral injury unless they have one of these uh, re-experiencing uh, um, symptoms so replaying the memory um, Replaying the memory, it's not a flashback. Very few people actually get full-blown flashbacks with PTSD. Maybe like no more than 12, around, I don't know, 12% is probably like the max um, of people that get full-blown flashbacks. A flashback is something like where you lose touch with reality. Um, you're actually in whatever environment that, that your trauma is. Um, so like car accident or like even like um, I've worked with people who had medical trauma so they had a surgery right and they'll have a flashback where they're actually in the operating room um, maybe the anesthesia didn't work right away or the way that it should have and they smell the smells of the operating room they see the lights that's a full-blown flashback those are very hard to manage and they're very hard to get people out we are going to talk a little bit about that but replaying the memory is more like if you think of um, like a Polaroid. Um, so it's like a slideshow of Polaroids going through your memory. Um, so you can see it, like if you think of how you remember stuff, right? Like just take a benign event, like driving here today or something, and you can kind of see pictures of that going through your head, right? Um, so re-experience in this context is that only it's like the worst event that's ever happened in your life. So you're looking down and, and seeing that it, your arm is gone or your arm is barely hanging on. Um, so you're replaying that, um, but you're not having the um, sensory like integration that would kind of be present with a full-blown flashback. Nightmares are, are, are probably the most common um, things that people with PTSD struggle with. Um, and you know, then it relates to sleep and a lot of this other stuff on here. It all kind of is a negative feedback loop, right? They all playing together, playing off each other. Um, and we do we treat nightmares in, in a couple different ways. We use medication to treat nightmares. And what the medication does is it makes the nightmares not as vivid. Um, it'll kind of be like if you imagine a dream where. It's just real vague, right? Like the action is kind of vague, the colors are vague, and you wake up and you kind of feel like you had maybe a stressful dream, but not really, and you can, you're can you able to go along with your day. Um, nightmares in relation to PTSD are very disruptive. People will wake up, um, they'll feel like they just completely re-experienced the event. Um, their pulse will be high, like 120 and above, um, a lot of sweating and stuff like that. Um, some people will have like, they'll actively like walk around in their nightmares, but again, those are pretty rare, rare cases in rare situations. Um, the hyperactive nervous system, so we're going to talk about the window of tolerance. What that is, is you're just on guard. And so you think about like, I don't know if anybody's ever gone through Six Flags Fright Night, right? Like, I hate that. But my kids like to go, but like, I'm on guard like the entire time. That's what the hyperactive nervous system feels like, but you're just going about your day, like every day. So you're, you're looking, you're scanning. Um, could this, could something jump out while I'm driving? Um, you know, and then you're, you're feeling like, like sensory details, like times 10 what's normal, right? And so like, um, that's where like touch will startle someone or it's like claw, like fingernails on a chalkboard, right? Um, well, you'll just, it's just overwhelming to deal with anything. And you get out of the window of tolerance into hypoarousal or hyperarousal. Um, and difficulty sleeping, well, part of that is you're amped up, right? And part of it is you don't want to have nightmares about the, the trauma. And so people like sleep very little, two, three hours. Um, and then you begin to lose interest in, in sex and lose interest in a lot of other things. Um, Avoidance. So avoidance is trying, not only trying not to think about the event, which is kind of like if I tell you don't think about a pink elephant and then everybody starts thinking about a pink elephant, um, which is you know really hard, but it's also avoiding anything related to that event. Um, and so uh, this becomes really hard like it, for people if like kids are involved and they have kids 
you know, because then they begin to avoid their kids because they'll see that trauma event, that, that situation in their kids. And then so they'll begin to avoid all that, all, everything. Um, avoiding hospitals with medical procedures. Um, so if someone has a, a trauma related to a medical procedure, then they'll just begin to avoid anything related to that hospital. Or um, any, then the, another hard part about this is it'll trickle down to their family. Um, so <laughs> I was working with a, a client one time, and um, he had a situation where he was in like involved in like it was an assault, and it was like a kind of a riotous situation. And so he would refuse to go grocery shopping or to Walmart because it was so dangerous. And this is like a 35-year-old guy, like muscular, in shape, um, refused to go out uh, to any store or anything like that. But he would send his wife and his kids to the store, so, which doesn't make a lot of sense. If these places are dangerous and you, know, you have to be on guard, why would you send your family? And I brought that up to him, and he really didn't have a good answer for that. Got kind of upset with me about bringing that up. Um, but it was one thing, that, and that's the, the beliefs and the perceptions that we have to begin to challenge in, in working with PTSD is it's not always rational, right? And you get away from rational, but to the person struggling with it, it seems completely logical unless that kind of perception is challenged or the, the veil is kind of taken off. Um, emotional reactions. This, you know, this will look a lot like depression, right? Um, depression and PTSD have a lot of overlap. A lot of people, if they're not willing to talk about, like the re-experiencing and the, how they're feeling inside, they'll they'll talk about this, the emotional reaction piece, and they'll get diagnosed with depression. Um, and so that's just something that we, we you know we have to keep aware of. And because depression treatment and PTSD treatment are vastly different, um, you know, it, it's be, it would be better to treat somebody with depression uh, with PTSD treatment rather than the other way around. Because somebody with PTSD, if you just do cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectical behavioral therapy, it's not going to have an effect on PTSD um, or very small. And then changing world view is so uh, um, the world is extremely dangerous. People take on a lot of the responsibility themselves, um, and they become very self-critical. Um, the world is dangerous is a hard one to get at, right? Because it kind of is, <laughs> you know? And so, like, driving is dangerous. Like, you hear the commercial, like, a motorcyclist dies every day on Texas roads, right? And, you know, and there's, you know, they have those signs that says, that, you know, I don't know how many thousands of people die each year on Texas roads. And Thomas J. Henry's, inter like, commercials and, and then the news, you know? So it is dangerous, right? And one thing that we have to talk about and really get across is, you're right, um, but there's what probability like there, you have to talk about probability like there's always a chance absolutely but you have to start looking at what is the probability of something happening and generally the probability of something bad happening is is, is pretty low uh, especially like when you're talking about like really significant traumatic events um, you know it, they just don't happen all that often um, and then here's, they added this in the DS, the most recent DSM-5, um, depersonalization and derealization. Um, so these are disassociative um, ideas or dis different associative, disassociative symptoms. Um, and that can be like, the depersonalization one is like, um, you feel like you're in a dream state, right? And so like, these things aren't really happening to me. Um, like I, I'm, I'm f like disconnected from that. The problem is, is people will disconnect like whenever they're triggered, right? And so it, you can't, you can't work through an experience if you're disassociating or depersonalizing from from the experience. Um, and then derealization. Um, so that would be like in a medical procedure, if someone like feels like they're outside of themselves and the events, these things aren't really happening or like, um, you know, like this didn't really happen, so I'm going to deny it. And then they're triggered and they're never able to face like what really happened in that situation. Here at Laurel Ridge Treatment Center, we take an immense amount of pride in providing superior treatment and care to our patients. 
We understand that the road to recovery is a long one, and it is not always easy to seek treatment. However, we also know that a mustard seed of hope goes a long way. If someone has the belief and desire to overcome their issues, we would like to be here to provide them the necessary support, encouragement, and skills they need to live the life they deserve. One of the unique things about Lower Risk Treatment Center is that we offer a full continuum of care for all populations with programs from acute care, partial hospitalization, and a children and adolescent residential program. Providing this full continuum of treatment allows us to transition our patients to a higher or lower level of care as needed. Our acute programs are designed to provide crisis stabilization while giving our patients the opportunity to develop a unique skill set that will allow them to learn to manage their current emotions while providing medication management where appropriate. Our adult partial hospitalization program helps to address current life stressors by providing intensive therapy while giving the patient the opportunity to return home daily to practice the skills they are learning in the program. Partial hospitalization offers individual, group, and family therapy. The treatment modalities address issues related to mood disorders, substance use disorders, trauma, grief and loss, and interpersonal issues. Intensive outpatient program and our virtual intensive outpatient program is also offered to help provide more access to care for working professionals or those that are demographically challenged. Additional therapeutic interventions are also offered to help patients learn how to better self-regulate and process through difficult emotions. These interventions include yoga therapy, art therapy, and recreational therapy. At Laurel Ridge, we will forever remain committed to saving lives, healing families, and creating hope. So risk factors, um, repetitive and prolonged trauma, so that's trauma on top of trauma. Sometimes it's called complex trauma. Um, I kind of think all trauma is somewhat complex, especially if you work with it for any amount of time. Um, and prolonged exposure to trauma. Um, so like, I know a lot of people are here for um, related to amputations. And so like, that, that could be like a prolonged uh, trauma. So I worked with a gentleman who, who he lost the bottom half of his leg in Iraq. And he would say, every time I look down, I, get, I feel like something inside of me. Um, and so that, you know, that is a, a prolonged trauma, like the trauma is continuing to happen, right? And so what we have to do is try to redefine that or try to use some type of education or attach some purpose to it. So it's just not this awful thing that happened to me, which is really, really challenging. It takes a long time um, to get at that. Pre-existing mental health um, issues, so any type of depression, anxiety, um, board, or bipolar, if that's present and people are introduced to significant trauma, they're just at a greater risk. The more violent something is, definitely, um, you know, and that can be car accident, it could be, you know, a hunting accident. Um, you know, anytime firearms are involved, that's a violent situation. Um, and then one thing that doesn't get talked a lot is uh, social support. So if someone experiences a trauma and they have a team around them that is very supportive, that kind of can rally around them, um, they're way less likely to develop PTSD because they have a way to process it right away. Um, the problem is that a lot of people won't talk about what's really going on. What are they really thinking? What are they really experiencing because they're embarrassed or they don't have that social support in place? I just saw a stat that um, most men right now uh, have between zero and two friends <laughs> that they can talk to. And so women do a little bit better, they're three to four. Um, but you know, for guys, like if, if we don't, if we have zero friends, who are we gonna talk to, <laughs> you know? Um, and so it, that social support is a huge, huge piece. Um, and then TBI, so traumatic brain injury, um, if someone's involved in an accident and they have a TB, TBI along with some, uh, something else, um, their risk for developing PTSD is expo exponentially higher. And that's because a lot of the executive functioning in the frontal lobe piece is in charge of kind of making rational choices and processing information in a healthy way. And if that's compromised, it's just the GO system is just all in. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is epigenetics. So epigenetics is, um, 
it's a changing in, in how we process information and different things, different stimuli within a generation. And so um, there's a couple different pretty cool studies. Um, Rachel Yehuda, she, she's probably the most uh, famous person right now. And she's studying how um, like in utero stress and in utero um, like trauma and trauma growing up, we call them adverse childhood events. And that's not just like, like a violent situation. It can be growing up in a really tough neighborhood and always having to be worried about like something happening, right? So that's a prolonged stressor. I'm growing up in a household where you have to like pay attention to how your parent is walking because that shows if they're drinking or upset or not. Um, that causes stress, right? And so um, what research is showing is that if, if people grow up in a highly stressful environment, if there's a lot of stress in utero, it changes how you now process stress. So the Poland, Poland starvation winter was in, during World War II. Um, the Nazis cut off food going into Poland um, by the rail, railways. And so basically they created a famine in Poland. And what happened then is um, the people went in after the war and they found um, moms that were pregnant or had just had babies. And they did a longitudinal study with those kids for like 50 years. And what they found was the, the kids that were in utero were very tiny during that time period. They de developed PTSD, addiction, depression, and bipolar at a much higher rate than the population outside of Poland. And so what that's kind of saying is they're processing life, they're processing stress, they're processing things at a much, in a much different way that's starting to cause, you know, um, more problems with mental health, more problems with PTSD, depression, substance use. So what they did when 9-11 happened is they, they replicated that same study. Um, and it, it was basically a, a mirror of the Polish starvation study. So those kids now are you know, in their 20s. Um, and same thing, um, they went to New York, found moms that were pregnant or had just given birth. Um, and those, baby, those kids right now are, de are developing PTSD, anxiety, depression, and addiction at a much higher rate um, than the regular population. Um, I don't want to get too much into, into this, but there's a really good book called It Didn't Start With You and Your Body Keeps the Score that gets way more into this stuff um, than I, I'm, I'm going to today. One interesting thing is the cortisol roller coaster. So cortisol is a stress hormone, right? Um, and you would think if someone has PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, you would think their cortisol levels are always going to be really, really elevated. Um, and what uh, they've found is that that's not the case. So people with PTSD, their cortisol level baseline is super low. And so what that means is it's hypoarousal. It's kind of a disconnection from what's going on in their lives and what's going on around them. But as soon as they have a, a, like a trigger, I'll use that word, trigger, um, something happens, their cortisol levels shoot off the charts, and so they're in hyperarousal. So that's that stress response, right? And, and, it's, and it can stay up there for way more, like a way longer time than what should be like associated with that situation. And then when the situation is kind of over, it bottoms out again into like disconnection, hypoarousal. And so that's why you can, you'll see people that can go to work, right? And they're functioning really high, but they're just like redlining it the whole time. And then they go home and they just like kind of disconnect. And so the, it really affects like relationships with family and friends and kids and stuff like that because they've been going so hard so long that then they're stressed. They're not, they don't respond properly to normal stress. So like if their kid falls and gets hurt, they might not respond in a way that's appropriate. They might just not even notice it or brush it off. Um, so the cortisol roller coaster, it's a tough thing to manage. Um, but I, I think it's really interesting because I would have, before reading those studies, I would assume that cortisol is always high. Um, this is just an, a picture. It's an example. It's the best illustration I can use for what people have described to me what PTSD feels like. 
Um, and what this is, it's just, it's a, it's a French painting, um, but people have over and over explained to me, like, it feels like my mind is one thing and my body is something else. Like I'm set, my mind is separated from my body and a lot of times I don't have control over my body and I'll have control over my, my mind and vice versa. And so there's a disconnection when someone is in active like PTSD symptomology. And what we're trying to do in treatment is bring those together. So you begin to develop control over both your mind and your body, your responses to triggers and how your body responds to triggers, both mentally and physically. Um, so here, here's really what's going on. Um, there's four things that are really playing a part with PTSD in your brain. So your amygdala, your amygdala is it's an old part of your brain. It's, it's, it's there for survival. Um, it, it's your alarm system. So it goes off anytime like you're in a, a stressful situation. Um, it responds, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And so it decides what you're going to do, and then you just kind of follow through with that. Um, it, 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 it's hard because um, once you have, so like I'll use an example of being around people, right? Like I can be around people, I can be fine. So my amygdala isn't like going off at all, right? And then let's say like with a, a riot or something happens and I have, a, a PT, I have PTSD related to that. And now every time I'm around that same type of environment, my amygdala is going off because it has new, a new memory attached to that environment, that situation. Um, the next piece is your hippocampus. So that, your hippocampus is in charge of storage of those memories. And so think of it as like a filing system, right? You can have 20 normal interactions with a situation, and then you have one that is outside of that norm, like a trauma, and, but that one is gonna be at the front of the filing cabinet. So now, unless you work on it, every time you're in that environment, you're, that's the one that's gonna get pulled out. So it's a threat, right? So I need to fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, and then I have a full like um, nervous system response to that. Um, the thalamus, so most triggers are related to our sensory details, so sight, smell, touch, taste, um, sound. Um, and the thalamus is kind of like the input system. So it takes in a smell and then it goes to the hippocampus, like, is this like a threat? Oh, it is a threat, then your amygdala activates. So what we're working on is the prefrontal cortex. Um, to get that activated, to get that into, okay, if I was involved in like um, something with a kid, and then I see my kid, I'm not gonna have a, like a, a automatic negative response. Um, this is not the same situation. All this stuff is happening though, like so fast. Um, and that's why like it takes so long, um, you know, to, to work through PTSD, um, and it, it, why it's so intense, the, the treatment aspect of it. So this is just a, a, a brain scan. Um, of a healthy brain and a brain with somebody who has PTSD. And if you look, like it's lit up in like kind of the wrong areas and it's really lit up in those areas. And so um, that means your brain is just working and working and working, right? Um, one of the, the big struggles with PTSD is attention, be, being able to focus, right? And what this is, is uh, it's a scan of people's ability to focus. So the further those lines are, the less focused the person is. The one on the left is a healthy brain and they're able to just maintain their attention, their focus. Um, the brain on the right is a, a brain of somebody with PTSD. You can see how disconnected those things are. And so that would be like the blank stare kind of, um, you know, people call it the thousand mile stare. Um, uh, but it, they're someplace else, right? You can be talking to them and they're just not there. You can tell they're not there, uh, but it's really hard to bring that focus back. Um, and, and that's one of the, the challenges in working with PTSD too, is like some of our sessions will be two hours long and to ha keep bringing someone back to focus, to focus, refocus, where are you at right now? Um, that can be difficult. So the, those are just two examples of kind of what's going on in the brain. 
um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, so we have the physical, the brain, the body part of it, um, and then how does this all show up in lo- in our lives? And I think this this slide does a good example of sh- of sh- showing how it affects like the environment, right? Relationships, um, just the need to for everything to feel like it's in my control. Um, so if it's not perfect, I'm not doing it, uh, which is a real bad negative feedback loop because that ends up kind of controlling people and their movements. Difficulty with uh, touch and, and also, and that's a lot of the stimulus thing. And just separating from people um, to not having strong connections, not being able to bond with others. Um, this is just a, f- a slide. <laughs> I, when I first got into PTSD treatment, I thought, well, we'll do breathing and meditate and it'll be awesome. It'll be super easy. And that's not what it is at all. Like it's hard work and it's a lot of hard work by the patient. Um, a lot of difficult conversations and a lot of going back and talking about the worst thing that's ever happened to people. Um, and so that gets really challenging just as a clinician and as because you don't want to have too many you know sessions in one day because it is exhausting if you know if you're in it and focus with the person um, here are some essential components of PTSD um, and a picture of Goodwill hunting because it's like my favorite therapy movie <laughs> but uh, so there, the way I see it there's four kind of pieces to uh, PTSD treatment, securing a base, safety, stabilization, and building skills and knowledge. Um, So the securing the base, that's the relationship with the therapist. And so it is so important that when somebody is experiencing uh, PTSD, um, one of the biggest things is trust, right? People don't trust themselves and they really don't trust other people. Um, And so as a therapist, as a clinician, you have to focus on that, that solid ground layer, which is just trust, like trusting in um, the relationship, trusting in you know what you're talking about and you know what you're doing. Um, it is vital. It, the, re- the therapist's responsibility in this um, has to be willing to allow the, the patient some autonomy to make decisions. Now, you know, I've done quite a bit of supervision, and one thing that people struggle with is kind of becoming the rescuer victim roles. So the therapist will really want to, and it's like, it, it's not like, it's not, they don't do it on purpose or it's not like ill intent. They want to help, right? And so when they see something, they just go into rescuer mode. Um, the problem with that is, is there's a lot of like questioning and second guessing yourself when you have PTSD. And so it creates a, a dynamic of that person is still the victim. That person still can't trust themselves. And so you have to work really hard on like together kind of guiding someone through that situation um, and, and allowing them the autonomy to, to continue to make their own decisions. Um, the ability to choose which direction they want to go uh, is vital in, in therapy. So safety. Um, safety now is outside of that therapy room um, and it's getting into real life Um, so it's like what are my risk factors what are my triggers Um, how can I like manage some of those like there's maybe is there some unnecessary triggers or risk factors that I can kind of deal with or, or like not expose myself to and that's a fine line because that can cross over to like really negatively affecting your life as well. Um, So the therapist is gonna help people recognize those issues. Um, In doing like a safety plan and things like that, we're always working on building the window of tolerance. So the window of tolerance is like being able to manage day-to-day stressors and day-to-day life conversations, physical touch. So you're trying to make that window larger um, so people don't have like the hyper arousal response or the hypo arousal response. Um, and then stabilization and so that's like you begin to kind of get a hold of your symptoms right to get a hold of your uh, risk factors to get a hold of your triggers and you begin to able to you're able to manage those things in a much healthier way Um, and then you start being able to open up to relationships and so that's one thing with like PTSD support groups there's I think they're really valuable 
um, because it's everybody that has gone through something similar and they can talk about their experiences and and, um, like and start to relate to people again Um, and again it's managing like sleep hygiene all that stuff uh, um, outside of the therapy room and then this is just kind of a build on that so um, as you're going through therapy you're out you're always working to like strengthen people's view of themselves. People do a great job of beating themselves up really bad um, with PTSD. Um, like I said earlier, like they feel like they should have did something better, different, or shouldn't have did something. Um, and that would have really drastically affected the outcome, which isn't always the case. You know, Sometimes things just happen. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about exposure therapy. Um, exposure therapy. I found this quote by Joseph Campbell because I think it really encapsulates uh, what exposure therapy is. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. And so what exposure, or prolonged exposure therapy is, is, is just that. It's prolonged exposure to your trauma. And we do that in a couple different ways. So um, one way is through in vivo exercises, and that is um, confronting triggers. So it's confronting the things that, sensory things that trigger an emotional response. Um, And then we do that by, um, it's called uh, our imaginal. What it is, is it's taking that index trauma, the the trauma that people come for treatment, and you close your eyes and you record it, and you talk all the way through that, that trauma event. And so you start focusing on like sensory details and you do this over and over and over for like 12 sessions. <laughs> so it's really hard. Um, good therapists, are, are, you know, they manage. Um, so we have like a scale of disruption, like zero to 10. Once you get past eight, you're kind of going into disassociative areas. Um, so you kind of stop at that point. But you recount it, and the, the valuable piece of this is, is there, there has to be a processing after it. So you process the trauma, um, you process how you feel recounting the trauma. Um, these sessions can be you know, anywhere from, it's hard to do prolonged exposure in an hour, uh, I would say an hour and a half at the least, but it can go up to like three hours. Um, but you're just con- continually going in, you're trying to reorganize memories, trying to create new pathways with memories and then really challenging of unhelpful beliefs and thoughts. So the next one is CPT, it stands for Cognitive Processing Therapy. Um, and this is really focusing on stuck points, uh, which are just like our beliefs or ideas about us in relation to the situation. They're usually super negative, and our beliefs and thoughts about others in relation to this situation. Um, and so we go back in and you continually challenge um, those ideas. One thing about this is uh, like drastically different from um, prolonged exposure is there's no requirement to have like a, uh, I call it a trauma recount, but to go back over the trauma like in any form. Some people will have them write it out, but there's no data that says that's any more beneficial than not doing it. Um, and then the final phase is just the client takes on the role of challenging their own stuck points. Um, and th- this is t- outside of combat uh, r- related trauma, this, this treatment modality works great for like accidents, for medical, um, PTSD uh, situations, single incident traumas, uh, CPT is awesome. And this is just kind of an example of like one of the handouts that we use. So. Uh, what, what was your role in a traumatic event? This is probably one of the more valuable tools that, that I've found. Is it just this three levels of responsibility, right? Unforeseeable, responsible, fault, or blameworthiness. Um, and so it's a, a lot of people when they first come in for treatment, they'll be in the bottom two. A lot of them will be in the bottom one. Fault, it's my fault. And, and they really believe that and they cannot see any way, other way of looking at it. Um, but very like not a lot of situations have intended harm you know like you think of like a car accident nobody really intends that to happen right Um, now if you do the car accident responsibility so played a role in an event but didn't intend the outcome so that could be something like looking at your cell phone right or running a red light or speeding or or, you know something like that like you never intended for that to happen 
Um, but it did happen. And so there's regret there, but how do we, where do we go from here? Like, it's not helpful to stay in regret. Where, where do we go? And then from my experience, most people that develop PTSD are really in the, the top one is unforeseeable. So you were doing what you were supposed to be doing and this event happened. Um, it, it wasn't your fault. Um, but the outcome is a lot of sadness, a lot of grief. Um, the hard part about this is there's really no way to predict it, right? Like you've driven down that road a hundred times, you've gone to that bar a hundred times, nothing's ever happened. For whatever reason, this time something happened. Um, and the last one that I want to talk about is EMDR. It stands for eye movement um, desensitization reprocessing. Um, and so you use bilateral eye movements uh, to assist in the processing of trauma. Nobody really knows 100% why this works. Um, what people believe is there's some crossover when you use bilateral stimulation to, op to be able to open to different processing. Um, so to be able to like left brain, right brain, um, to challenge your beliefs, to challenge your ideas. And what it really does a great job is it desensitizes you um, you know, to the, like the trauma, to that situation. So this is the window of tolerance. Um, this is, so the window of tolerance, it's an idea, it's a concept that we use a lot in treatment. Um, and we all wanna be in the middle. So we all wanna be in the window of tolerance. Um, and that is your body, your mind, it's functioning at, at its optimal state. So you can assess and engage um, you have reasoning, you still have emotions, but they're not like off the charts. Um, this is where we like get things done. Now we all want to be in there. Unfortunately, it's really hard for people to stay in there, um, especially if it was something like PTSD. And so people tend to go um, in two different directions in, in, with window of tolerance, right? So you go into hyper arousal. Hyper arousal is like, it's like red line, think of like redlining a car, like you're just like on the gas, right? So um, you're overreactive to, to things, to everything. Um, you have unclear thoughts, like you can't really formulate like what you're feeling or what you're thinking. Everything's kind of jumbled. You're in some emotional distress. And so you feel overwhelmed, you feel sad, you feel grief. Um, you, can't, you can't bring it down. Um, you know, and so like, like a, a non, like a, kind of like what a lot of people experience is like after a day of work, maybe it was a hard day of work, you drive home, there's a bunch of traffic, you get home and your significant other like just starts like going into like, like how bad things were that day. You just like cannot take it, right? It's just like, you're t it's too much. You don't have any time to kind of like breathe, right? With PTSD, it's like that when triggers happen, right? And somebody's window of tolerance might be real low, and they'll go into hyperarousal really fast, like the smallest thing, right? So maybe it's, and maybe it starts in the morning. So maybe it's they can't find their socks, boom, they just kind of like overreact. They're on this high level of, of response, um, and they just can't bring it down, okay? Um, the way to get back down is a lot of grounding, a lot of like, managing triggers, so recognizing triggers for what they are, recognizing that you're safe, um, mindfulness, which is just kind of continuing to focus on being in the present. Hypoarousal, um, it doesn't get talked about, like hyperarousal, at least in PTSD treatments and things like that, it, it's really talked about a lot. Um, hypoarousal isn't talked about that much, and I think it's not talked about that much is because there's no explosion with hypoarousal. It's a going into yourself. Um, so there's been times where I was like eating with like um, someone at a restaurant and you know, like they're a combat veteran and I can just see them kind of go someplace else and I'll be talking to them, but they're really not present. Um, they're just like shut down, numbed. And it takes a little while for them to come out of it and then they're just, they come out of it and they're like, oh, it's just really loud in here, right? Um, and so it's a self-preservation um, tactic, tool, um, but it, it, it's, I think it's probably just as common, it just doesn't get talked about it. Some people will just stay in hypoarousal too, so those are people that 
you know, it looks a lot like depression. So they're lethargic. They don't want to get anything or do anything. Um, they're super unmotivated and just really numb to, to everything. Um, you know, and the way to get out of those things is kind of the same thing. Physical activity is probably the biggest difference between hyperarousal and hypoarousal. Um, and what this is, it's a lot of the, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system activating. Um, so the sympathetic nervous system will cause us to kind of go into these stages. And then we need the parasympathetic nervous system to respond. And we, we do that as a lot of breath work, a lot of breathing, a lot of visualization and, and positive. And also keeping your baseline kind of in the window of tolerance. So, you know, recovery from PTSD kind of happens every day. Um, and so we need to address it every day and able to, so we're able to manage it appropriately. Um, one of the things in, that I was taught like early on and that I've seen to be true is like, as Viktor Frankl kind of sums this up in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, in some ways suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds meaning. Um, and so like the, the gentleman that, that lost his leg, um, one thing that he, like by the end of treatment, what he talked about was, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to do some of the stuff that I'm doing now if, I, if this didn't happen. And so he, you know, he was really involved in some sporting things and, and like hunting and stuff like that. And those were opportunities, if you want to call them that, that were granted because of what happened to him. And the other thing that he, he started doing was talking about what happened to him and how he managed it. So he, he provided some meaning to him by helping others. Um, so he went out and he was really active in helping other people deal with, um, you know, uh, having an amputation and, and how he kind of managed and the things that he went through. Um, but that took, you know, it, it, I think we, it was his third treatment when he met with me in about four months of treatment uh, to get there. Um, so it's not an overnight thing. Um, it's, it's something that is really like time consuming. It's really hard. Um, but if you can find some purpose, some meaning behind it, it offers a, a, a way to get through these situations because sometimes you're never going to know why this happened. Like, you know, and, and that's a struggle is like, why me? Um, and sometimes you're just not going to know that. So you have to find some meaning, some purpose to go forward. Um, so I really appreciate you all uh, listening today. I hope it was helpful. Thank you all. And we're back. So now we're going to try to answer some of those beautiful questions you guys have sent to us today. Dr. Edwards? I, there was a question that was asked about leg discrepancy. Leg, leg discrepancy? Like the, the limb. residual limb. Residual limb, yes, yeah. to be precise. Mm -hmm. yeah, so residual limb is the remaining length of the limb itself. And typically surgeons will leave as much length as possible to create a functional residual limb. However, there is such a thing as a limb that is too long. If a limb is too long, then we don't have room for prosthetic feet right. that provide ground compliance, reduce fall risks, store energy to help reduce metabolic costs. So mid length is typically ideal where you have enough of a lever arm for controlling the prosthesis and distributing forces over a larger area in a prosthetic socket, but leaving enough room for modular prosthetic feet to have the best outcomes afterwards. On a muscular area there, so if you have, like you said, the imbalance, mm -hmm. how does that affect the muscle? Oh, true. So most, uh, most amputees are going to have what we call, as they try to compensate, for instance, uh, if they are afraid to use this new leg that they have, mm -hmm. they might compensate and start using more of using this leg as opposed to the prosthetic leg that they have. And once they do that, they might have low back pain. And, mm -hmm. and what I try to do is, again, make sure they can trust. It's, it's not easy to trust that leg. Can you? Right. Can you so, yeah, say something about that? Yeah. Trusting yeah. that leg. Can I really put... Pressure. My weight, like you have on your prosthesis, correct? Yes. You've trusted it for a while. I trust my leg 110%. I use it to work out. I use it to carry things. I can actually close my eyes and walk with it. Did so you trust it before? No, you, you have to learn to see what the limitations are per device. So everything has weight limits. Everything has different uses. Mm -hmm. So that's a good conversation to have with the prosthetist 
because he's going to or she's going to tell you what you can and not do with the limitations of that device. So even squatting, I squatted 425 pounds with my prosthesis in right. my good leg. Right. But I also broke my prosthesis. You I broke had, it. Yes. Did you did you have low back pain? Something that she mentioned. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not balanced, then uh -huh. you develop low ba uh -huh. back pain. So your your uh, knowing your limitations throughout the day is very important. If I you start to sink in your prosthesis, that can throw off your gait and your your balance, and then you you can't have by the end of the day you can feel it in your lower back. So you mentioned the sinking. Is that because of atrophy? Atrophy throughout the day. You're in the prosthesis, and all the fluid volume comes out into your body. Right. So your leg gets smaller throughout the day. The more mm -hmm. you use it, mm -hmm. then you have to put on socks to get the girth back. so you don't sink in, so you don't have the nice. back pain. So it, you, you literally have to carry socks with you. Real socks? Yes. They're for, they go <laughs> Specialized <laughs> prosthetic, prosthetic socks. Okay. Prosthetic oh, socks. Not, not, not the real... Not, not an the... actual sock for your foot, okay. but there are okay. specialized prosthetic socks that are provided with your prosthesis that are right. designed for that prosthesis. And working closely with the prosthetist as a prosthetic user is critical to make sure that you're applying the correct socks yes. so that you can maintain a symmetry, symmetry in your gait and loading of the limbs so that right. we don't develop these low back pains and overuse syndrome with compensatory gait. Yes. Compensatory gait. Now you're talking about socks. They are plies. That is correct. So what not does that every mean? sock is created equal. Some <laughs> socks are thicker than others and they are gauged by their thickness in plies. Mm -hmm. So several socks are provided, yes. thin socks of single ply, and then thicker socks of multiple plies and three or five ply combinations to accomplish the goal, which is maintaining a total contact fit in the prosthesis to reduce the sinking feeling through the day as limb And the volume pressure uses. applied to the residual limb is constant. That's correct. Now these are not to be mistaken for compression socks. That's correct. <laughs> correct? A compression okay. sock is used when you're not using the prosthesis mm -hmm. to maintain a constant shape of the residual limb to yes. prevent the edema that can happen after the prosthesis is removed. Amazing. Great Another point. question that came up is insurance. Mm -hmm. This is a, now... That's, a, that's an open-ended question. That's an open-ended, <laughs> yes. And a, a great debate and that could take... Who's paying for it? Well, it depends all on the insurance carrier. Um, when you work with different providers, uh, you have commercial, you have workers' comp, you have uh, uh, government insurance, which would be Medicare, you have supplemental plans. All these things have different coverage within each policy. So then you have different obligations from the patient, from the insurance payer, so different deductibles, different premiums, all these things are variables to that. Uh, delivery of uh, prosthesis. So that has to be dived in deep with the physician, with the different therapists. It could be a physical therapist that could put, have input and what the plan actually covers. And the, the, usually the front office and the prosthetic uh, office will help determine what your coverage is. Right. So and this coverage has to be comprehensive enough to, to make sure that everybody involved in that circle of care Correct. is paid. Correct. Including the physician. Correct. Okay. So what happens if somebody is not funded? Uh, we have cases in which the, the question came up. Somebody's not funded, has had limb loss. Then so, what? Then so, sometimes you uh, go back to the community. There's nonprofit groups that can help out. There's uh, amputee groups that can help out with resources. There is the church that comes in and steps in mm -hmm. and can help out. There's also uh, fundraising events that you can do to help support the cost of a, a prosthesis. There's also state return to work programs. So it's all based on your where you're at, and, but you have to go look for those resources. Nobody's gonna come to you, you have to go so find them. So how are you gonna Proactive. find them? You don't have a case manager, you don't know where to start. I mean, this kid just had an accident and he lost a leg. Now this kid was a, a cashier at HEB. Well, I would definitely talk to the, if you're inpatient, you're going to have inpatient resources that are connected to the community. A lot of times those are the case managers and the therapists. Mm -hmm. When they go outpatient, a lot of the uh, prosthetists have connections in the community okay, right, okay. that they can provide that support. You know, it's, it's amazing. We've talked about wonderful stories right here. We've seen the, the story of Thomas, amazing Paralympic, yes. who won medals. And, and also, we've heard your story story that tells us that in spite of what
comes at us from whatever direction, we can adapt, we can withstand, recover, and do a lot of things. And give back. And give back. And give back. Okay. This, Linda, <laughs> I know we've been chatting off, off camera, but you have stories, you have nuggets of knowledge and wisdom. You have an experience. Share, if you would, your, your story. You know, I have my, um, my mother who uh, had a massive heart attack and had to go and have uh, a cabbage. Mm -hmm. And uh, post-op in recovery, she ended up having another heart attack that caused a lot of issues for her. Mm -hmm. The bottom line with that, she had to go on pressers. It mm -hmm. caused her mm -hmm. to lose circulation in her fingers and her toes. Mm -hmm. Her hands bounced back, but her feet didn't. Yes. And it um, proceeding, it took about, oh, another six months of uh, her really fighting uh, to keep her feet. But at the end, she ended up losing them and needed yes. to get a prosthetic. She never lost faith. She was, it was not going to define her. Mm -hmm. uh, she was the bravest person I've ever known in my life. Mm -hmm. And I learned that resiliency can come at any age, right. through any circumstance, mm -hmm. if you just have faith. And right. she had faith in herself. She had faith in her team that was working mm -hmm. with her. You were her doctor. Yes. And um, she loved you mm -hmm. and she trusted you. And you have to trust your provider. Mm -hmm. You have to trust your caregivers and the people that you're working with. And that's so important that we remember that. That is a key element in resiliency too, is the team of people around you that helps you fight. And that's one thing I remember most about her. Yes, it's a powerful story. Uh, I, I knew her mother. Very well, she was a good friend, a good family friend. And uh, as she said, she, she went in for a procedure and developed a hyp hypoperfusion. She went into shock and she had another heart attack mm -hmm. so that she needed pressure support and she developed gangrene in her extremities. The gangrene was bad in her feet uh, that there was no other option than to amputate her feet. Mm -hmm. And I remember her, she, was, she had reached a point in her life, she developed that resilience the ability to fight, and she did fight, mm -hmm. even to the end. And so that in itself is important as we talk about resiliency and the fact that we talk about limb loss. Never, and how give, important. Up the, never give up the fight. Never, never give up the fight. the fight. Never give up the fight. But again, to some people, what did it take for your mom to get to that point? Did you have to get in and, 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 and jar her back and say, Mom, you can do this? You know, initially, yes. It took, that's where, that's where I come from, that your, your support system is key. Mm -hmm. um, I was that support for her. I mean, I was by her bedside every day. Mm -hmm. I was with her every day. She fought the fight for three years mm -hmm. of her life. And she was, and in those three years, 25 of those months, mm -hmm. she was in the hospital fighting one thing or another for very long periods of time, for weeks and weeks at mm -hmm. a time. Mm -hmm. It was very hard for her but she stayed positive. Mm -hmm. And I never um, let her feel like she was alone in this journey, in this, mm -hmm. this battle that she was in. So mm -hmm. I always maintained a very positive attitude with her and that kept her positive. And I was, I was her advocate. I mean, there was times that she could not be her own advocate. And I was her advocate for everything. Um, from fighting insurance companies to get something paid or to get her to have this care over here um, for everything that was going on with her, whatever she needed. I was that advocate for her. And, not, and I understand that not everybody's that lucky to right, have right. somebody to be their advocate. But if you can have that, love that person and embrace them because it's hard on the caregiver just like it is on the person that's going through this and it's you're not going through it alone they're going through it with you with you and um and you have to remember that to be patient with them you know because they're being patient with you and that's that's really key that's very very key I have two brothers that have both amputate amputate amputated legs and um have one that's doing incredibly well and I have one that is not and one that's resisting the the help and support and um, he's going through struggles because mm -hmm. of it. And that's a key, I mean, when I look back and I look at it, I look at the big picture, I really do see the differences of resiliency when you really have the will to fight and to live and when you don't. 
And it doesn't matter if you have the support or if you don't. If you don't have that will in, in mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. Interesting. We have, we have to find a, a way to reach these patients or anybody mm -hmm. right. who has had a traumatic loss in their lives. Yeah. And it's a loss. You said how, how many, 25% of you? Yeah, 25% of me is gone. It's gone. Mm -hmm. But you had family. I had family. You had exposure. Yep. You knew that your resources. Right. I had uh, uh, Peter, John, Mary, whoever, might not have those resources or that advantage point. That's a great. So I would say reach out to us and we can connect you in a community. Mm -hmm. We can connect you with all those resources that you need. So I can call you? You can call me. Uh -huh. You can email me. You can text me. I'm, I'm available to help out. Anytime. Yes, and this this show does not stop here. So you, we do have our points of contact. You can uh, we are known in the community. Uh, all you have to do, if you, you can actually reach out to him, you can reach out to any of us, and we are more than able and willing to help in whatever crisis you might find yourself in, including limb loss. So another question that came up is pain management. Yes, we've had a, a series of pain management is critical because uh, I was told that. Uh, well, how do we handle pain management? And this is, there's no simple answer in the box. It fits, this fits everybody because people are so individualized. Some people need more pain med medications than others do. I'm for a comprehensive pain approach that involves, because we do have a, an opioid crisis right now that's occurring nationwide, I want to make sure that when people are given pain medications, they're given for a purpose, that they are functional. Is that right? We don't want to give somebody medication, go home, sleep in your bed, and don't wake up the next morning and come back in a month and get more pain meds. Sure, that is not the goal of interdisciplinary care model. Mm -hmm. Right. You have to be functional. One of the big things that I see as a patient uh -huh. is there's this idea that the physicians, the nurses, the staff can take away all my pain. No matter what they give you, your pain is still there. Mm -hmm. You still have some level of pain. Mm -hmm. But you have to function through that pain mm -hmm. and move forward. Mm -hmm. So some, you have to embrace the pain, if you will. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the team to help you in that process, but it's still within yourself to push yourself. And sometimes it's the timing of the medication. So when you know when you're going to physical therapy, you know an hour before that is the best time to, to, to get your pain med so you can mm -hmm. get your best outcome in therapy. So working with the team, timing it all, making adjustments to that, helps get people through that process. But are you gonna be 100% pain free? I can honestly tell you, no. Don't get it in your head that you're gonna be 100% pain free. There's no 100%. Life. There's no 100%. It's in that, you know, it, you're, you're so right about that because sitting at the bedside of my mother and also my, my brothers when they've gone through their procedures to, th the pain never went away and they could not understand why their pain wouldn't go away and they kept wanting more and more pills and pain pills and the doctors kept saying no we can't give you any more you're Sorry. maxed out and so they saw it as abuse to them that they just want them to suffer and it's like, it wasn't about that it was yes. about first of all protecting you and making sure that you're safe and you're not going to overdose on anything mm -hmm. but they just couldn't get past that they could not be pain free like they were before the accident or before the amputation Right. And Correct. so that's a misconception that I feel that is out there, that people need to understand that it comes, it's part of it. It's part of it. It's but, just but, part of it. Yeah, but by the same token, we don't want their pain to be ignored. Because there are some Correct. people, especially military type, Yes. you know a few, mm -hmm. who are going to say, I'm going to take it like... Mm -hmm. I, 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 yeah. I eat it up, give it to me. They give it to me, yeah. but then they're not functional. Right. They're like... Mm -hmm. Have you seen those? Mm -hmm. Too much pain. Ooh, I Trying can't even... to deal with all the symptoms and coping on their own and not using the resources of the team. Pharmacologic pain medications, right. psychosocial, mm -hmm. physical, mm -hmm. being part of something, having something to look forward to. Right. Even antidepressants can help. Yeah, antidepressants. So we do know that uh, in some cases, most some cases, especially post-op, uh, opioid therapy help for, for, for a season. And then we can couple it with... Uh, Patients like Neurontin, Lyrica for neuropathic type pain. We can also use tricyclics for that component of pain. We can do a combination therapy. We can also use SSRIs or, mm -hmm. to help. That can be used in conjunction with 
what we call adjunct therapy. What about topical? Topicals, yeah. You've used, used topicals too, didn't you? Yes. And they worked? Yes. I uh -huh. used lidocaine 5% mm -hmm. and that worked mm -hmm. on my neuroma site, for example. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then I've injected uh, people in the residual limbs for their neuromas and they've gotten good relief right. so that they can progress. The idea here always in medicine is because we want to avoid the, the complete shift. Oh, I don't want anything. I'm good. I'm going to become an addict. Mm -hmm. We got to counter. There's got to be judicious middle ground. Is that correct? Correct. Reverse, because they're not going to progress, and uh, they'll be coming to see you. They'll be frustrated. They won't be able to walk, and they're going to blame everybody. Wait a minute. How come I'm I'm hurting? And what's wrong? Mm -hmm. Well, you're hurting because you're not taking a medication that's prescribed. So, mm -hmm. yeah, prescribing and taking your medications and being compliant. Oh, it's key. It's compliance. Key. <laughs> Why am I looking at you? Oh, <laughs> because I have seen this a thousand times with family members that they just, mm -hmm. they don't comply. And when they don't get comply, they deteriorate. And then they wonder why they're deteriorating. They want to blame everybody else. And they don't want to take the accountability on their own. So compliance is key. And maybe Absolutely following key. the rules that have been laid out by a physician or following medication guidelines, if that's not working, that's not the end of it. It's not mm -hmm. you that is the problem. Yeah. Providing that feedback, attending those follow-up appointments with your physician right. is not mm -hmm. giving up and continuing to be compliant and stay to those appointments so the treatment plan can be revised and refocused on that patient's mm -hmm. current needs. And I think you know, bringing your family to those appointments are, are important too because it gives a different mm -hmm. perspective from the family, what the family says and does versus what the patient says and does. Well, that's a different reality. Yes. It's a completely different, because I went to many appointments with my sibling and um, he wanted to complain about how I was taking care of him and the doctor just reiterated, first of all, she really cares about you. She really loves you. And the things that she's doing is to help you heal and get better. Wow. Yes, but she's not letting me eat what I want to eat or she's not letting me drink what I want to drink. and. She's, she's making me she's, go to my appointments for my physicians. Yes, and she's making me do my blood all that. She said, those are the things she's supposed to do. And you do that for somebody you love. And so wow. is she reiterated my position as a caregiver for my loved one. And um, he didn't like it. Really? He didn't like it at all because it went against what he wanted to get across. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it gave me as a caregiver, okay, then I am doing something right then I am actually doing something right here yeah. because you start to feel yeah. like, am I just doing everything <laughs> wrong? And, um, and I'm not really doing anything here. And, and in reality I was, and she, you know, confirmed that for me. Mm -hmm. And I had a little bit of, of affirmation from her. It's like, and it made me feel better about what I was doing okay. for him, even though it was tough love. Tough. <laughs> My mom was no different. She was very picky about her eating and what she yes. wanted to eat and her food. You remember yes, that? Oh yes, my goodness. Yes. God bless her. May she rest in peace. But boy, she was complained about food all the time because she, she liked what she liked. And, uh, <laughs> and it wasn't good for her. <laughs> it goes, yeah, and that goes again to, uh, from a medical standpoint, a diet is very important because if people have underlying peripheral vascular disease mm -hmm. due to diabetes, Mm -hmm. or they have high blood pressure issues, or, or peripheral vascular disease with poor vascularity, that can, whatever you do to patch things up, mm -hmm. it's not gonna do anything. The, it won't, because the, you've got to go, we've got to go back to basics, the basics building bricks. If it was a traumatic event, what if it was a vascular event that they had? Mm -hmm. I mean, they have a, a bad vascular, vascularity in that limb that caused them to lose it in the first place. Sure. Yeah. They have diabetes, they have vascular disease. Are they being managed appropriately? Are they following treatment? Inpatient or outpatient? Outpatient. Yeah. Outpatient. It starts inpatient. It starts inpatient. And then they have to follow the, the, the rules and guidelines set forth from the dietitian and the physician right. of what to do. Because if they have an elevated A1C uh -huh. and they're not compliant and they're eating whatever they want, and especially here in San Antonio, we can attest to that. Mm -hmm. we, we, by the way, in San Antonio right now, for those right. of you who are... In San Antonio, we have a problem. We have a problem with... Diabetes. 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 Type 1, type 2. Type 1, type 2. Uh, people are not going to want to eat whatever they want to eat. And they don't want to be told what to eat. That's exactly right. 
and they're going to giant size every soda drink. I'm sorry, soda. They're going to do that. And what are they going to do? They're not going to exercise. They're not going to take good care of themselves. Right. And if they don't do that, is this team approach going to work? No. It's going to be effective. less effective. Right. right. Less yeah, effective. Absolutely. Everybody that's a part of the team is important, including the individual themselves that are seeking help yeah. by feeding themselves correct nutrition so that the team can take over and have an impact. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's controlled in the, in the hospital setting, but what it's the, the challenge is in the outpatient setting. When they get home. When they get home. So there was a, sometimes oh, sometimes ahead. people, yeah. you know, they show love differently and they show love mm -hmm. through food. Mm -hmm. And so you have the, the overwhelming uh, 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 giving uh, of affection through through I'm bringing you a, a pie, I'm bringing you yes. a, a hamburger, I'm bringing you, a, you, you need to eat. Mm -hmm. French fries. French fries, all this stuff. So Super size. All these things have an impact on that. Mm -hmm. so. so there was another question that came up. Yes, sir. The role of diet, how does it play? There's a dietitian listening. How, the, the, the question was, what role does diet play in somebody who has had an amputation due to peripheral vascular disease. Or not only per peripheral vascular disease, doctor, mm -hmm. it also has to, uh, um, with fittings of the mm -hmm. prosthesis. Mm -hmm. So if you have a weight gain or weight loss, it's gonna impact your fitting. And mm -hmm. your fitting's wrong, your gait's wrong, your injuries go up. Mm -hmm. So all these have to be completely balanced. Uh, you will atrophy over time, but a good diet it, it makes you stable. And when okay. you're stable, you can do things through life. Okay. Interesting. What was that why mom could eat whatever she wanted to eat? Yeah, my mom thought she could eat whatever <laughs> she wanted to eat. And she realized real quick that was not the case. Yes. I want to thank everyone who attended today. And thank you for the outstanding questions. Team Resiliency is here to help you achieve outstanding patient outcomes. Please reach out to us if you have any questions about prosthetic care, PTSD, I would like to thank our sponsors, New Life Brace and Limb, Giovanna Rehabilitation, Medicine and Pain, and All Seasons Home and Health, and Laurel Ridge Treatment Center, and the Methodist Healthcare System. Without their support, this would not have been possible. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.